Chapter Zero of the Wild Irishman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. Chapter Zero. Preface to the American Edition. The people of America may or may not indulge kindly views of the Irish community, but there cannot be the slightest question that the Irish of Ireland have kindlier feelings for America than ever they have had for England. To the Irish of Ireland, in fact, America has long stood in the relation of a sort of promised land, and they have a habit of turning their thoughts thitherward even when small matters are concerned. There is a tale of an elderly lady of Galway, who on being informed by her medical attendant that it was desirable that she should consult a dental specialist, set forth incontinently for New York, to the total neglect of London. She believed that of the two places New York was the friendlier. I am informed that, broadly speaking, New York is policed by Irish Americans, and that the American Irishman makes a rather useful subordinate municipal official. Be this as it may, there can be no doubt that very considerable numbers of Irishmen contrive to do themselves a great deal better in the United States than they could ever have hoped to do in their own native Erin. To those Americans and American Irish, who happen to be at all interested in the present condition and prospects of the green country, I venture to offer the following pages for what they are worth. T. W. H. C. End of chapter zero. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter one of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 1. Distressful. The person who invented the Irish question may or may not deserve well of his species. In a sense, of course, there has been an Irish question since the beginning of history. But it is only within the last century or so that we have begun to spell it with a big Q. That big Q perhaps attained its largest proportions during the eighties of the last century, and associated, as it usually was, with a capital G which stood for Gladstone, and a capital P which stood for somebody else. It certainly did yeoman service whenever a use for letters could be found. At the time of Mr. Gladstone's home rule campaign, the existence of a highly insistent Irish question could not be doubted. A good deal of water has flowed under the bridges since then, however, and at the present moment, and in view of the present situation of Irish affairs, one is tempted to wonder whether there now exists, or whether there really has ever existed, an Irish question with a big Q at all. It is true that at the time of writing there is an actual and undesirable famine raging in Connemara, it is true that the population of the country is on the decline, and that the standard of comfort among the people will not bear comparison with the standard of comfort in any other country in the world, unless it be the poorer and bleaker regions of Kamchatka. And it is true also that Irishmen as a body continue to exercise themselves, both at street corners and on all sorts of platforms, in a habit of rhetoric, which many years of shouting have made second nature with them. For all that, the Irish question, as a portentous and vital matter, appears to be somewhat played out. One may safely say that in Ireland, at any rate, it has been reduced to an obscurity, which allows of its being now spelled with about the smallest Q, in ordinary use among printers. In England, it has been allowed to disappear in favor of the Russo-Japanese War, protection, and do we believe. On the whole, though, it no doubt harrows the souls of the horde of carpetbaggers, 
which have come to us out of Ireland. This condition of affairs is exceedingly salutary for Ireland itself. Now that the factions and the tumult and the turbulence and the wrangling have died down, or at least been in large measure abated, the facts about Ireland are for the first time in history, beginning, as it were, to swim into our ken. We are beginning to perceive, for example, that out of the quarrels and bloodshed of the past hundred years, Ireland has emerged triumphant. It has been a case of a bankrupt, downtrodden, and dwindling people's fight against a rich and powerful dominant people. And the weaker side has proved clearly that in the long run, God is on the side of justice. To all intents and purposes, Ireland is, at the present moment, in full possession of all that she herself has felt it reasonable to demand. She has the franchise, she has land laws, which are almost socialistic in the benefits they offer to the cultivators of the soil, and she has local self-government. More than all, she has herself begun to recognize that the disposition of England toward her is becoming year by year less arrogant, less implacable, less contemptuous, and less severe. It has been said that Aaron's appeals for reasonable treatment at the hands of England have had to be made by violence of the most brutal and terrorizing kind. She has stood before us with the head of a landlord in one hand and the tail of a cow in the other, and screamed till we gave her what she wanted. And always in a large measure we have succumbed. And the singular part of it is that in no instance have we had cause, nor do we appear likely to have cause to regret it. Of course that crown and summit of Irish blisses, home rule, has not yet been vouchsafed to her. But this, I believe, is due to the fact that Ireland herself is still making up her mind whether she really wants it. Half Ireland says, Give us home rule. The other half says, Please don't. And the two parties seem to be getting on very well together by agreeing to differ. This is a true and natural settlement of a problem which, as I believe, is purely artificial, arising out of the exigencies of party and the jealousies of rival demagogues, rather than out of the desires of the people. If Ireland, in her heart of hearts, desired home rule, she would have it within the next couple of years. She has the good sense to know that, however fascinating the theory of home rule may appear, the practice of it for her would be difficult and irksome, if not altogether disastrous. Both sides are agreed that home rule for Ireland means an immediate spell of civil war for Ireland. The Irish Catholic will tell you this, and the Irish Protestant is equally clear about it. In view of the condition and nature of the country, such a war were a calamity to be staved off at pretty well any cost even if it were certain, and it is by no means certain that the subsequent benefits would be appreciable and lasting. The politicians will tell you that it is possible to have in Ireland what is somewhat prettily called a union of hearts. The union of hearts which I desire, says one of them, is a union of Irishmen of all classes and of all creeds, from the north to the south, from the east to the west, landlords and tenants, Catholics and Protestants, orange and green, and I look to this union as the surest way of bringing about a national regeneration of our country, which is exceedingly beautiful, but amounts to asking for the moon. Oil and water cannot be made to mix, and in a country where a couple of cardinals and a number of bishops were lately stoned by a rabblement of Protestants, the union of hearts may be reckoned still a great way off. Holy Ireland, and I think it is rather to her credit, will never be brought to do what England and Scotland have managed to do, namely to set the political and material interests in front of the religious and spiritual interest. Catholics and Protestants in Ireland are Catholic and Protestant from head to foot and right through, and you will never induce them to forget it. All the same, it is not impossible 
with the exercise of a little charity and self-restraint for the line to lie down with the lamb politically if not religiously and this is what is happening in ireland in other words the irish catholics and protestants have tacitly agreed that they can live in more or less amity under one government providing that government is neither an irish catholic government nor an irish protestant government but an alien impartial and practically secular government as we have said the irish question as a portent and terror to england is disappearing if indeed it has not already disappeared for all that the fact remains that ireland in the main is a distressful country thackeray snooks gives it as his opinion that of all the womb count with that i ever weed of hang me if ireland isn't the wometh womb yea an irrepressible epithet though it may be is really and deep down not the epithet whereas distressful is there are people in the world who are born to misfortune whose lives are touched with melancholy from beginning to end and who cannot be brought to rejoice even by act of parliament ireland's woes may be said to be largely temperamental and still more largely misfortunate her very position in the geographical scheme of things is strikingly lonesome and unhappy practically she is the last outpost of europe and a little one at that with sheer atlantic on one side of her and sixty miles of sea between herself and england it is impossible for her to get rid of a certain feeling of isolation which is not good for the spirits the soft rain that is always over her may heighten the green of her meadows but it keeps her damp and watery and preternaturally boggy she has no harbors of the kind that are essential to fishermen and though some of her ports may be admirable there is little in the country that calls for the use of them thus physically handicapped Ireland has necessarily produced a people who are in all respects a people to themselves. The religious faculty in them has been highly developed. The commercial faculty might seem to have been left out of their composition. By nature they are a simple, cheerful, unambitious, warm-hearted race, and they have suffered accordingly. Sir Francis Drake, or some instrument of his, planted the potato upon them james i planted the scotch on them george the third gave them a lord lieutenant and a secretary the potato the scotch and dublin castle have been the three bitter curses which have brought this people to the ghastliest social and political passes all three are ineradicable but they may be mitigated this is what ireland wants End of chapter 1 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 2 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson T. W. H. Crossland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon Chapter 2 The Shillelagh as the yorkshireman is said to sport on his escutcheon a flea a fly and a flitch of bacon so in the popular imagination an irishman of the real old sort is usually conceived in association with a pig a pipe and a shillelagh rightly considered one supposes that the shillelagh is a survival of the prehistoric club in any case it is a weapon of some character chiefly notable for its handiness in the matter of skull cracking and believed to be the pride and joy of every patty worth his salt the shillelagh has undoubtedly earned for the irish a reputation for roguish and heroic delight in battle tread on the tail of my coat now is supposed to be forever on irish lips with immediate results in the article of broken heads and when we english wish the use of a metaphor for rows and scuffles free fights and so forth we have a habit of remarking that the affair amounted to a regular donnybrook donnybrook of course being a sort of feast of shillelaghs to which all ireland was wont annually to repair 
of the number of shillelaghs in ireland at the present moment the blue books give no account it seems to me doubtful whether there are a thousand in the whole country one may travel through ireland for weeks on end and come across nothing of the sort the only shillelagh i had the pleasure of seeing in the course of a recent lengthy irish journey was in the hands of a very ill-clad youth who looked more like a lancashire cotton operative out of work than a broth of a boy and the shillelagh in question was of polished black wood without knots and the top of it had a nickel silver knob like a bow's cane the weapon indeed reminded me of nothing so much as a salmon and gluckstein silver-headed ebony walking stick cut short the owner proudly assured me that it was his bit of a blackthorn and the finest for miles around it seems more than probable that the shillelagh notion of an irishman had at one time something in it while donnybrook fair has been suppressed there can be no getting away from the fact that there once was a donnybrook and a pretty warm one to boot says the poet who has e'er had the luck to see donnybrook fair an irishman all in his glory is there with his sprig of shillelagh and shamrock so green his clothes spick and span new without e'er a speck a neat barcelona tied round his neat neck he goes to a tent and he spends half a crown he meets with a friend and for love knocks him down with his sprig of shillelagh and shamrock so green and for love knocks him down is quite in the rail owled spirit a spectator at the donnybrook held on the twenty ninth august eighteen twenty eight described it as follows i rode out again to-day for the first time to see the fair at donnybrook near dublin which is a kind of popular festival nothing indeed can be more national the poverty the dirt and the wild tumult were as great as the glee and merriment with which the cheapest pleasures were enjoyed i saw things eaten and drunk with delight which forced me to turn my head quickly away to remain master of my disgust heat and dust crowd and stench made it impossible to stay long but these do not annoy the natives there were many hundred tents all ragged like the people and adorned with tawdry rags instead of flags many contented themselves with a cross on a hoop one had hoisted a dead and half putrid cat as a sign the lowest sort of rope dancers and posture makers exercised their toilsome vocation on stages of planks and dressed in shabby finery dancing and grimacing in the dreadful heat till they were completely exhausted a third part of the public lay or rather rolled about drunk others ate screamed shouted and fought the women rode about sitting two or three upon an ass pushing their way through the crowd smoked with great delight and coquetted with their sweethearts it is notable however that our eyewitness continues my reverence for truth compels me to add that not the slightest trace of english brutality was to be perceived they were more like french people though their gaiety was mingled with more humour and more genuine good nature both of which are national traits of the irish and are always doubled by Puccin. not only is donnybrook gone but the whole atmosphere which rendered donnybrook possible appears to have gone with it the knocking down of a friend for love or out of sheer gaiety and volatility of soul no longer ranks among the irishman's accomplishments if he fights at all which is seldom he fights now with clenched teeth and a fierce hatred at his heart and usually it is about religion and has nothing whatever to do with either fun or pachin in dublin no more fighting goes on than occurs in the average english city of the same size in belfast the fighting is frequent but it is eminently scotch and therefore not to be charged against ireland out of ulster there is scarcely any fighting at all pachin or no pachin 
at the same time in one city out of ulster which i will not name i was advised by the proprietor of a hotel to prolong my stay because we are expecting riots on monday whether the riots came off or not i do not know but i saw no accounts of them in the papers it is of course common knowledge that shillelaghs laid on one side the irishman makes an admirable soldier in point of fact he is a much better soldier than the scot though he has never had the credit for it the best english generals from wellington to lord roberts have been irishmen which is a paradox not a bull the irish never run away in our late wars certain non-irish regiments which were neither english nor welsh did run away it is significant that mr kipling's soldiers in soldiers three for example are irish cockney and yorkshire and that the irishman is set down for the smartest man i have seen it remarked and i believe it can be justified out of the military histories that while the irish and english regiments have usually done the rough and tumble hand-to-hand -hand fighting in our most famous engagements the gentlemen with the bare knees have had the good fortune to be sent in at the tail end of the trouble merely to execute a little ornamental sweeping up to the eye of officers and women nothing looks nicer than kilts and spats to disarrange them were a pity therefore whenever possible we should hold them in reserve on the parade ground and in processions the same thing applies the plaudits of the crowd being invariably forthcoming for the bonny bare-legged laddies newly enlisted mayhap out of glasgow and dumfries while seasoned irish warriors go past without a hand-clap but it is the kilts that do it there may be nothing in this and anyway i do not suppose that the irish care twopence but the points for us to remember while we are on this part of our subjects are that the shillelagh is an effete weapon that in irish differences the principle of a word and a blow does not prevail and that the irish soldier is very competent and very courageous end of chapter two recording by john brandon Chapter Three of the Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter Three. Larney. Larney has come to mean a certain adroitness and winningness of speech supposed to be peculiar to the Irish. If an Irishman opens his mouth, the English and Scotch insist on assuming that they are being treated to Blarney. The persons who affect Messrs. Cook's tours hang on to the words of every Irishman they meet, particularly if he be a Jarvey, and wait lovingly and with bated breath for the same phenomenon. There are no snakes in Ireland, and sad to relate, there is very little blarney. Broadly speaking, the people seem too poverty stricken and too apathetic for talk of any kind, much less for the sprightly loquacity and skilfulness of retort which we call blarney the irish jarvey who is commonly believed to be an adept in the art is just as much a disappointment as the london cabby even in the noble city of dublin you find as a rule that you are being driven by a dull flea-bitten porter-full person who has really not two words to say for himself that he is a daring and reckless driver i am quite willing to admit that he has a passion for stout and whiskey goes without saying but that he is a wit or a humorist or a wheedling talker or in any sense gifted above ordinary hack drivers i deny in the smaller centres of population and in the country districts he is even duller and more flea-bitten and more taciturn when he tries to charge you treble fare which is his usual practice he does it with a snap and gracelessly as a pointer out of local monuments he lacks both salt and information he has no gift for entertainment and he drinks sullenly and with a careful eye on the clock 
as for the irish waiters grooms handymen railway porters and kindred creatures of whose powers of humorous persuasion and repartee so much has been written i have no hesitation in pronouncing them to be a sad uncertain curt fiddle-faced company with scarcely a smile or the materials for a smile among them their conversation is monosyllabic their manner barely civil their apprehensions slow and their habits slack and perfunctory and they are about as blarnified as the trafalgar square lions of the peasantry i could only say that cheerfulness whether of notion or word is not nowadays their strong point they have a great way of saying your honour to you if you're a man and your ladyship's honour if you are a woman but after that the amount of blarney to be got out of them is infinitesimal grinding poverty short commons a solitary life on some dreary mountainside and a fine view of the workhouse do not tend to sharpen the irish tongue any more than they sharpen the irish wit on the whole therefore i am inclined to think that nearly all of blarney that should be in ireland has for some reason or other taken unto itself wings and flown away the people are no longer racy of the soil even the gentry who once had the credit of being roguish and devil-may-care to a fault are become sad and sombre and flat of speech the milk of human kindness in the irish blood appears in short to have gone sour and in place of the old disposition of humour we have a tendency to cynicism and vituperative remark and when an irishman turns cynic or vituperator he takes a wonderful deal of beating as witness the utterances in parliament and elsewhere of that choice body of gentlemen known as the irish party or the proceedings of the dublin corporation or the lucubrations of the irish press a singular exhibition of this particular irish weakness has quite lately been offered us by no less a person than mr samuel m hussey who i believe rather prides himself on having been described as the best abused man in ireland of mr gladstone mr hussey writes as follows if napoleon was the scourge of europe mr gladstone was the most malevolent imp of mischief that ever ruined any one country i heard him introduce the motion the land act of eighteen eighty one in the house of commons and his speech was a truly marvellous feat of oratory he was interrupted on all sides of the house and in a speech of nearly five hours in length never once lost the thread of his discourse as far as i could judge he never even by accident let slip one word of truth to do them justice the irish members gave such an exhibition of blackguardism as has no parallel on earth though it earned but the mildest rebuke from their obsequious ally mr gladstone mr gladstone considered that if you gave a scoundrel a vote it made him a philanthropist whereas events proved it made him an eager accessory of murder outrage and every other crime it is only fair to mr hussey to say that he himself has received as good as he gives for example an irish demagogue once treated him to the following sam hussey is a vulture with a broken beak and he laid his voracious talents on the conscience of the voters booze the ugly scowl of sam hussey came down upon them he wanted to try the influence of his dark nature on the poor people groans where was the legitimate influence of such a man was it in the white terror he diffused was it not the espionage the network of spies with which he surrounded his lands he denied that a man who managed property had for that reason a shadow of a shade of influence to justify him in asking a tenant for his vote what had they to thank him for a voice rack rents they knew the man from his boyhood from his gossoonhood 
he knew him when he began with a collop of sheep at his property in the world laughter long before he got god's mark on him it was not the man's fault but his misfortune that he got no education laughter he had in that parish schoolmasters who could teach him grammar for the next ten years the man was in fact a uriah heap among kerry landlords cheers here surely is blarney with a vengeance among a people which was otherwise than glib of expression such writing and such oratory would be difficult to evolve when presumably cultivated men for mr hussey's assailant in this instance was a priest allow themselves to indulge in such childish objurgation what wonder is it that the commonality should be found to have lost their sense in what is proper to decent speech and reasonable argument the demagogues of ireland have indubitably gone a great way toward ruining the native taste and innate good breeding of the irish people like the halfpenny papers of england they have made their fortunes and their power by the degradation of the masses it is possible that the poverty of the country left them absolutely without other weapons wherewith to fight the haughty national enemy england it is certain that without these demagogues and without their raging and blistering words and the foul and brutal actions which frequently followed them landlordism in ireland would never have been scotched as it is the landlord has been put in his place and the chances of the natural heirs of the soil have been greatly enhanced no drastic revolution of this kind can be brought about without loss even to the winning side and in my opinion not the least of the losses of the winning side in this matter has been the transformation of blarney into flatness and combination under the heels of the tyrant the irish people retain their faculty for mirth and mirthful speech the exhortations of the demagogue and the agitator have brought them freedom opportunity and a distinct abatement of spirits as the world goes one is now compelled to reckon ireland in the same category that one reckons those innocuous islets named man and white there is no more devil in the isle of dogs than all ireland is for the moment in a position to show it is not ireland's fault and it is not england's fault it is the horrible fault of the nature of things whatever has happened in the past has happened because nothing better nor worse could in the nature of things have happened what will happen in the future remains to be seen it may be peace and the rehabilitation of a kindly lively and interesting people it may be peace and the dullest sorts of apathy and decay in any case it will be peace the times which after this saturday review is admittedly the least consistent journal published on this footstool has frequently been reproved over the mouth for remarking years ago that in a short time a catholic celt will be as rare on the banks of the shannon as a red indian on the shores of manhattan this in effect was prophecy though it is a hundred to one that the times did not know it if the resilient and recuperative powers of the irish people have not been destroyed there is hope for the irish people in ireland if those powers have been destroyed there is no hope for the irish people in ireland blarney even of the recuperative order will go entirely out and the low scotch will come entirely in i will do the low scotch the credit of saying that if they had their way and no irish catholics to contend with they could make ireland a highly successful business proposition inside a quarter of a century whether they will ever get the chance is on the knees of the gods for my own part and this is not blarney i hope sincerely that they never will end of chapter three recording by john brandon Chapter Four: The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter Four: Whiskey. 
The universe as we know it abounds in enigmas, and perhaps the most stupendous enigma of all of them is called whiskey. In Scotland, whiskey is the universal ichor and panacea. In Ireland, a kind of whiskey which is unquestionably whiskey but not scotch stands in the same friendly relation to the people. In England, we drink both kinds, lying thus between the devil and the deep sea. There cannot be the slightest doubt that the baser sorts of whiskey are scotch, and that the primal, more edifying, and more inspiring sorts, if we only knew it, are Irish. He who drinks beer thinks beer. He who drinks whiskey thinks whiskey. He who drinks Scotch whiskey becomes as the Scotch people, who, as all men know, are a hectoring, swaggering, dull witted, bandy legged, plantigrade folk. He who drinks Irish whiskey becomes as the Irish, who should be nimble and neat and vivacious, and thriftless and careless, and lavish and decent, and otherwise gracious. The wise man, of course, will let both varieties pass by him, excepting that he take them in thimblefuls, and then only in the shape of nightcaps. Unless the United Kingdom Alliance misconstrue what I have now said, let me here say roundly and flatly, and out of a good heart, a plague on both your whiskies. The Scotch, it is true, is better to your taste. But the Irish has the merit of being better to your ethical or nobler parts. The effect of Irish whiskey upon Ireland is a matter that might fittingly form the subject of six or eight stout volumes bound in calf and prefaced by the life of Father Matthew. The appealing and startling beauty of Irish whiskey as a potable spirit appears to lie in the fact that it has never done Ireland any harm. The number of whiskey sodden persons in Scotland and the number of whiskey sodden persons in Ireland stand in the ratio of ten to one. In Scotland, the red nose and the pimply face abound. Outside that fearsome area known as the diamond, there is scarcely a red nose or a pimply face in all Ireland. All the best Scotch whiskey is produced in legitimate distilleries. And all the best Irish whiskey, with due respect, of course, to Dunville, Jameson, et hoc Janus, comes out of little places which are unbeknownst to the king's officers of excise. This, however, is merely extraordinary, paradoxical, and inexplicable, and has nothing whatever to do with ethnology. But to return to the point, whiskey in Scotland is a religion an institution, a tradition, and a national reproach. Whiskey in Ireland, on the other hand, is an accomplishment, an ornament, a mellowness, a kindness, a simplicity, and a joy forever. The true Irish people drink it wisely as the Gaul takes his wine. When you see a number of drunken persons in Ireland, you may safely assume that they are Orangemen and of Scotch descent. The Irish of Ireland do not get drunk, which means that they neither royster in bars nor soak alcoholically at home. According to Mr. Hussey, Irish whiskey is vilely adulterated, both by the publican and in some of the factories. In support of his statement, he tells the following story. On one occasion, a Kilorglin publican was in jail, and his father asked for an interview, because he wanted the recipe for manufacturing the special whiskey for Puck Fair. It has been a constant practice to prepare this blend, but the whiskey does not keep many days, as may be gathered from the recipe, which the prisoner, without hesitation, dictated to his parent. A gallon of fresh fiery whiskey, a pint of rum, a pint of methylated spirit, two ounces of corrosive sublimate, and three gallons of water. 
which is to suggest that the Irish have no palates, and that like the gentlemen who ate flypapers in mistake for oat cake, they are poison proof. Frankly, I should be disposed to take Mr. Hussey's recipe with great reserve. It is amusing, doubtless, but a chemist would shake his head over it. Practically the only undesirable drinking which goes on in Ireland proper is done at wakes. But even Mr. Hussey admits that wakes are on the decline, and not by any means the occasions for overindulgence which they once were. It is all very well to visit a country town and single out half a dozen notorious drunkards with the view of proving that the Irish people are drunken people. I say that the Irish people in the lump are a sober people, though they may not be teetotalers. I will go further and admit that they have a wonderful appreciation for the wine of the country, and that at times some of them even get hearty. But this is not to say that drink rages in Ireland as it rages in Scotland, or for that matter, as it rages in the poorer quarters of our English cities. And I believe further that taking the whiskey of Ireland all round, it is a much sounder and less sophisticated spirit than the bulk of the whiskey consumed in Scotland and England. Mr. Hussey assures us that the increase of lunacy in Ireland has been pronounced by the committee which sat on the question in Dublin to be mainly due not only to excessive drinking, but to the assimilation of adulterated spirits. With all respect to the conclusions of this committee, I do not think that those conclusions are borne out by the facts. Lunacy in Ireland is the direct outcome of the most unthinkable poverty and squalor of the greater part of the population. When you couple with poverty, want of occupation, a solitary life, and an enervating climate, not to mention the melancholy brooding propensities of the Irish peasant, it is no wonder that lunacy claims many victims. To allege that because a lunatic has been in the habit of consuming a considerable quantity of puchin, his lunacy is necessarily due to puchin, seems to me to be begging the question. If you could alleviate the poverty and inaction to which the Irish peasant is condemned from the day of his birth to the day of his death, you would have gone a long way toward eliminating lunacy from Ireland, and at the same time, I believe you would find that you had not seriously reduced the consumption of whiskey. The fact being that the consumption per head of the population is reasonable. In this, as in many other respects, Ireland has been grossly misrepresented, both by serious and humorous writers. The humorous writers, indeed, have been the graver offenders. Many of them seem incapable of conceiving the Irish character in any terms but those of hilarious and flagrant alcoholism. It is a profound mistake, and we shall be helped materially in our endeavors to comprehend and placate our unfortunate sister kingdom if we dismiss forthwith from our minds the idea that she is utterly and perceptibly given over to inordinate drinking. End of chapter 4 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 5 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon Chapter 5 The Patriot Ireland has produced more patriots than any other country under the sun. The names of them are Legion, and from Wolf Tone down to Dr. Tanner they have all been men of reasonable parts. O'Connell, Emmett, Butt, and Parnell shine out perhaps as the greatest of them. The smaller fry do not require enumeration. But if I mistake not, while it is the fashion to flatter every Irishman who has done anything at all for Ireland with the general title of patriot, 
it is only within comparatively recent times that the authentic patriot has come into being the fact that in england people are unkind enough to call him an agitator is of small consequence the patriot is singularly and peculiarly irish there is nothing like him in england and there never will be anything like him for he comes like water and like wind he goes he begins anywhere he may be a butcher a publican a schoolmaster or a farmer he attains a seat in the house of commons and a certain prominence in the press and he ends nowhere irish editors worship him for a season then they wax critical of him then they forget him altogether mr timothy healy is a good type of the patriot at his best he has accomplished great things for ireland and achieved for himself a reputation in parliament for a sort of savage brilliance but there are not a dozen men in england ireland scotland or wales to-day who care twopence where he is or could tell you what becomes of him when parliament is not sitting he will end obscurely inasmuch as it is the fate of irish patriots so to end as the chief of the patriots of the less glorious type who however succeed in making the best of both countries we may instance mr t p o'connor mr o'connor is an irishman and a nationalist but he has shaken the dust of ireland from his feet and he sits for the scotland division of liverpool and has done himself rather well as a promoter of heterogeneous newspapers in london with mr o'connor however we shall deal fully elsewhere only for the sake of symmetry do not let us forget that he is a patriot of the finest water the vital defect in the character of the irish patriot looking at him squarely is that in recent times at any rate he has never been a statesman a patriot with the proper statesmanlike qualities might it is true have been altogether swamped by the frothy eloquence and wild demands of the main body of patriots but such a one if the irish could only have managed to find him and keep him going whether in the house of commons or on english platforms would in the long run have made a vast difference to her interests it may be argued that ireland did actually find a statesman in mr gladstone on the other hand it is abundantly evident that however sincere and admirable mr gladstone's proposals for the betterment of the country may have been they were not based on anything like an exact or for that matter even a working knowledge of its necessities and requirements as for mr parnell it is no disrespect to him to say of him in full view of his amazing career that he was not a statesman even in a small way his aloofness haughtiness and chilliness of temper precluded him from a really effective part or lot in the faction which he led and ruled with a rod of iron and for himself he had not sufficient spirits and imagination to carve out an independent and statesmanlike policy mr parnell made a great name and no little dust in the world yet the verdict of history upon him will be that he was neither an o'connell nor an isaac butt and that he failed to go anything like so far as might have been expected of him for the rest of the patriots the remnant as it were of the national party they do not matter and they know it in the house of commons they are absolutely without other than adventitious power the english party system happened to afford them certain mechanical advantages of which they are never tired of boasting their sarcasms and humours and occasional displays of temper bring them from time to time a passing notoriety but taking them as a body they are inept irresponsible feeble and negligible constituting indeed a standing monument to the undesirable vagaries which might be looked for in the event of their being granted that much desired little place of their own on college green in fine the irish patriot 
of our times will not wash he means well by his country and well enough by himself but he has no balance and is entirely blind to the falsehood of extremes it is curious to note how easily ireland is satisfied in pretty well all matters that concern her closely her standard of requirement is barely middling she knows how to be grateful to the merest nonentities and she can bestow reverence and undying fame upon persons who are little removed from mediocrity the modern patriot has never risen above the foothills yet for ireland he stands upon the pinnacle and they say hosanna to him it is a sign of the times however that erin is beginning to be alive to the fact that in the main the patriot is just one of those persons with whom you can very well afford to dispense vaulting ambition hath rather overleaped itself in the matter of these gentry and their posturings and screamings and clenchings of the fist are no longer received with altogether unanimous applause that there is reason in all things is a simple lesson which patriots who are not wholly careless of their future will do well to learn their well-worn parrot cries of tyranny oppression cowardice robbery murder and so forth are become just a trifle stale flat and unprofitable irishmen are weary of shrieks they desire a trifle of sobriety and good sense end of chapter five recording by john brandon chapter six of the wild irishman by thomas william hodgson t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon chapter six orangeman in matters irish it is quite usual to talk of aiming at the manifestly impossible if we could get rid of the priests some say ireland would be a happy country but nobody suggests how it is to be done because everybody knows full well that it cannot be done and nobody pretends to be quite sure that benefits would result if it were done for myself i believe that one of the most salutary things that could be done for ireland at the present moment would be to get rid of the orange men though they are of course a much older organization they occupy in ireland pretty much the same position as the passive resisters occupy in this country in other words while they proclaim themselves to be the friends of liberty they are in reality nothing more nor less than the friends of intolerance and tyranny a grand orange demonstration will be held in Donegal on Tuesday, 12th July, 1898. Who fears to speak of Derry, Ogram, and the Boyne? Papists, stand aside. We conquered you before, and can do so again. Our motto still is, down with home rule. Hurrah for King William, and to hell with the Pope. This is a sample orange proclamation quoted by Mr. M. J. F. McCarthy in Five Years in Ireland. Now, 75% of the population of Ireland are Roman Catholics. What is more, they are Roman Catholics of the devoutest and most devoted type. Probably the Orangemen do not number 10% of the population, yet they are allowed to insult the head of the Roman Church in the grossest manner with absolute impunity. If any secret society or other body in Ireland were to post a notice in Donegal tomorrow announcing a grand national demonstration and winding up with some ejaculatory remark as to hell with Mr. Balfour, there would be arrests and terms of imprisonment and howls from every corner of England. It goes without saying that the Pope is not Mr. Balfour, and when His Holiness is wished to hell, nobody is really a penny the worse but can it be claimed for a moment that there is either justice or reason in allowing such insults to be placarded in the midst of a catholic population nobody above the level of a scotch presbyterian would attempt to justify anything of the kind it may be that when the orange lodges were founded they had a use and were necessary for the protection of the protestant religion 
against the wiles of Roman Catholicism. At the present moment they serve no purpose whatever that is not essentially evil. In point of fact, they are organized centers for the encouragement of bibliowist sentiment and the open flaunting of the power of an ill-conditioned minority over a decent and fairly tolerant majority. The Protestant religion in Ireland must be in a distinctly parlous condition if it requires any such backing or any such protection. The fact is that nothing of the sort is necessary, or believed to be necessary, even by the more bigoted Irish Protestants. That being so, Orangeism would seem to be ripe for extirpation. If the English government were as secular as it is commonly held to be, the Orange Lodges would have short shrift. It is their supposed connection with religious liberty which shields them from suppression. Yet every Irishman, Protestant or Catholic, knows well that the religious element in Orangeism is little more than pure farce. The entire Orange forces of Ireland could not muster a couple of saints, lay or clerical, to save their lives. At the present time, the Orange faction is literally powerless to do anything but create disturbances which are in effect street rows of the most vulgar and ill-considered nature. The stoning of cardinals belongs properly to the same order of sport as the baiting of Jews. Neither pastime would be tolerated for a moment in England. Why the Northern Irish should be indulged passes comprehension. The majority in Ireland is green and Catholic, as opposed to a tiny minority of Orange and Protestant. The majority has an admitted right to its way in England. Why not in Ireland? Much has been said as to the sinfulness and wickedness of Mr. Gladstone in disestablishing the Irish Church. I am not sure that even the Catholics are quite convinced that Mr. Gladstone's action was wise. But one thing is certain, namely, that the disestablishment of the Irish Church was eminently just, having regard to the relative position of religious parties in the country. The suppression of the Orange Lodges, or at any rate, the penalization of Orange demonstrations, ought to have followed a matter of course. There will never be real peace nor content in Ireland till Orangeism is deprived of its present scandalous powers of annoyance, disturbance, and tyranny. Toleration on both sides, Catholic and Protestant, is the only hope for a united Ireland, or for an Ireland that is to work out its own social and political salvation, and you cannot have tolerance where you have an organization of chartered reactionaries who, in spite of their alleged religious purpose, are little removed, whether in temper or intention, from the common hooligans of London. The Irish Catholic Church, which after all possesses some say over its adherents, has during late years done all that lies in its power to prevent collisions between Catholics and Orangemen. It avoids as far as is possible the occasions of such collision. It is careful neither to provoke nor challenge, and in practice it literally turns the other cheek. The Irish Protestant Church is equally anxious for peace, and equally assiduous in its efforts to secure it. Yet Orangeism flaunts itself at large, and without let or hindrance. It furnishes forth riots o' Monday, at its own sweet will, and hoots and mobs and waves crimson handkerchiefs, and throws stones and breaks windows and heads to its heart's content. There is really nobody to say it nay. Authority stands by and winks. For is it not the great principle of Protestantism that is being protected? And are not these same Orangemen vigorous and violent anti-home rulers? Herein, indeed, you have the true inwardness of the modern English attitude toward King William's men. The domestic quietude of Ireland and the religious freedom of two-thirds of her population cannot be of the remotest consequence compared with the maintenance of the Union. That Ireland no longer seeks home rule does not matter. 
Orangeism has severed the Unionist passing well in the day that is just past. Let it reap its reward in the shape of leave and license. It deserves well of England. Who shall raise a finger against it? And moreover, it is Scotch, and the Scotch are the backbone of Ireland, as of England, manners and morals, and all other decent things on one side. As I indicated at the beginning of this chapter, to attempt to rid Ireland of Orangemen, or to attempt the impossible, but to deprive Orangism of English approval and countenance is possible. Break up the lodges. Bring to bear on the suppression of Orange demonstrations and Orange disturbances one tithe of the forces you brought to bear against Irish nationalism, and you will have gone a great way toward removing the last obstacles to the peace and contentment of the Irish people as a body. End of chapter 6 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 7 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 7 The Low Scotch. I have no desire to offer in the present pages a rehash of a former work of mine, which is said to have provoked the Scotch to the point of laughter. What I do desire to assert that, in my humble opinion, it is the Scotch, or alien population, of Ireland, which has been at the root of Ireland's principal troubles throughout the past century. Ulster may be a fine kingdom, the wealthiest, most industrious, and the wisest and happiest in the country, if you like. Yet it is Ulster that bars the way in all matters that make for the real good of Ireland. Every proper Irishman knows this, and Ulstermen will make no pains to deny it. Rather are they disposed to glory in it, and to brag about it. Ireland, they will tell you, is their country. It is they who have made it. They who have saved it. They who have enriched, beautified, and adorned it. They point to the linen industry, and to the shipbuilding industry. They crack about Belfast, and Porta Down, and about eminent Ulstermen in every walk of life. There would be no Ireland at all, if it were not for themselves. They rule Ireland. What Ireland wants, she may have, if it pleases Ulster. What Ireland does not want, she must have, if Ulster so much as not. That, at any rate, is the view of Ulster, the view of the thrifty, douce Scotch bodies whose fathers got gifts of other people's lands, from James I of England and VI of Scotland and whose sons go up and down and to and fro upon the earth, calling themselves Irishmen of Scotch descent. There are no Irishmen of Scotch descent, and Ulstermen are not Irishmen, unless their descent be Irish. Failing this, they are simply interlopers, or at best colonists and plantation men, and they had best put the fact in their pipes and smoke it. Nobody can deny that it was a bad day for Ireland when they came grabbing and grubbing to her shores, just as it was a bad day for England when she took up with them. They got Ulster for nothing, and they have kept it for that same. They have lived and waxed fat on Irish plunder, and the whole force of English legislation has been directed toward maintaining them in their place, fostering their projects, pampering and propitiating them, and protecting them against the wicked, degraded, unreasonable Irish outside. Nor have they been content to confine their greedy attention to their own proper kingdom, which is not theirs. Where the carcass is, there will the vulture be, and where there is a soft job or obvious pickings, there you will find a Scotchman. So that throughout Ireland, Scotchmen have been scattered wherever the government could find a place for one. There is scarcely an office, sub-office, or sub-deputy office worth the having in all Ireland which has not been made the perquisite of a Protestant Scotchman. Even the congested district's board employs Scotch factors, and Tom's almanac is little more 
than a catalogue of scotch patronymics and the pride and insolence and unfairness of them from a booklet called the scot in ulster written by a scotchman and published if you please by blackwoods of edinburgh i take the following their english and scotch origin seems to me to give to the men of ulster an unalienable right to protest as far as they are concerned against the policy of separation from great britain to which the irish with the genius for nicknames which they possess at present give the name of home rule could sophistry craft subtlety disingenuousness or the scotch genius for cunning misrepresentation go further to say that when the irish people have said home rule they meant separation is to promulgate a deliberate and wily untruth the irish people proper invariably mean what they say no more and no less home rule never meant more nor less to the irish than a parliament on college green it was the scotch and the scotch alone who set up the cry of separation for a bugbear and a boogie wherewith to frighten the timorous english ruler into stubborn acquiescence in the scotch view of irish affairs yet here we have a scotchman assuring us in cold print that home rule is merely an irish nickname for separation i note with considerable satisfaction however that a scotchman will the author of the scot in ulster proceeds religiously to give away the whole scotch-irish question for centuries says he the scot has been wont to wander forth over europe in search of adventure the italic is ours as a rule he turned his steps where fighting was to be had and the pay for killing was reasonably good again the italics are ours these scots who have flocked from leith or crail or berwick to seek fortune in peace or war on the continent of europe were mostly the young and adventurous for whom the old home life had become too narrow they took with them little save their own stout hearts and their national long heads these two are our italics the time arrived at last however when war with england ceased and internal strife became less bloody and scotland began to be too small for her rapidly growing population for in those days food did not necessarily come where there were mouths to consume it italics of our own which famine stricken ireland may fittingly ponder then the scots true to the race from which they sprung for norman and saxon and dane are we think of it began to go forth like the northern hordes in days of yore the women and the children along with the breadwinners and crossed the seas and settled in new lands and were fruitful and multiplied and replenished the earth until the globe is circled round with colonies which are of our blood and which love and cherish the old land of the mountain and the flood tut tut and now mark us it was in the beginning of the seventeenth century when the first of these swarms crossed the narrowest of the seas which surround scotland it went out from the ayrshire and galloway ports and settled in the north of ireland the numbers which went were large they left scotland at a time when she was deeply moved by the great puritan revival they took with them their scottish character and their scottish calvinism clearly they had both hands full they founded the scottish colony in ulster thus it comes to pass that the foundation of ulster society is scottish it is the solid granite on which it rests glory be the history of this scottish colony seems worth telling for it is a story of which any scotsman at home or abroad may be proud where is my crimson handkerchief its early history is quaint and interesting are italics there is much suffering and oppression in the story of the succeeding years are italics but there are flashes of brightness to relieve the gloom the men which this race of scotsmen has produced 
are worthy of the parent stock the contribution which this branch of the scottish nation has made to the progress of civilization proves that it has not forgotten the old ideals the portion of ireland which these scotsmen hold is so prosperous and contented that it permits our statesmen to forget that it is part of that most distressful country i venture to thank heaven and saint patrick that the statements we have last italicized and the word we have put in capital letters embody the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth examine them o sons of erin and take heed that you are the people and that the scotch are but the sons of belisle and astaroth what has holy ireland to do with these vapours these swaggerings these smitings of righteous breasts who be the grubby grimy galloway grasping governmental hucksters that so by implication and innuendo condemn you the proper and legitimate owners of ulster ask of the winds which far around strew scotchmen and the devil on the fair places of the earth you are innocent to put up with it you fought the landlords and beat them hollow we conquered you before and can do so again be done with this scotch obsession good can come out of ireland and irishmen as well as out of ulster and scotchmen lo that green island is yours not theirs seven tenths of it are in your hands to do with as you will there is not perhaps another country on the face of the globe where more good solid work is waiting to be done where greater capacities lie dormant yet where trifling of all kinds so abounds that is the verdict of an irishman and an irish catholic upon you in sober truth you groan as england groans under the scotch superstition nobody can be prosperous in ireland save scotchmen nobody can manufacture but scotchmen nobody can farm but scotchmen the view is entirely false encourage it no longer remember who you are and make an end of trifling end of chapter seven recording by john brandon chapter eight of the wild irishman by thomas william hodgson p w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon chapter eight priestcraft are there too many priests in ireland yes is dublin black with them yes do they appear to be as frequent on the countryside as crows yes are they extorting from the irish people money which is sorely needed for secular purposes yes here you have four pertinent questions which invariably crop up whenever ireland is discussed together with the average answers to them it is the priests cry both well and ill-informed according to the latest critic who it seems once occupied the somewhat superfluous position of literary editor of the daily mail one of the heaviest drags upon the life of ireland is the religious vocation the monasteries and nunneries prosper and increase choking and interfering with the circulation of labor and of industry in the country also it is my profound conviction that a large proportion of the present misery in ireland is not only bound up with but is actually a result of the country's religion also the houses of the people are so indecently poor and small the houses of the church are so indecently rich and large out of the dirt and decay they rise proud and ugly and substantial as though to inform the world that at least one thing is not dying and despondent but keeps its loins girded and its lamps trimmed this roughly is the indictment appended are some of the figures upon which it is based mr michael mccarthy himself a catholic says a cardinal three archbishops twenty-five bishops two mitred abbots and two thousand seven hundred twenty-two secular priests together with a host of regular priests of all the different orders such as jesuits franciscans vincentians holy ghost 
Carmelites, Passionists, Augustinians, Mary Immaculate, Dominicans, Cistercians, Marists, Redemptorists, and so forth, all of whom flourish in Ireland. Such is the force which constitutes the formidable clerical army of the Catholic Church in Ireland, and its auxiliary forces are the numerous orders of nuns, Christian brothers, lay brothers, attached to the regular orders, and so forth, together with the great body of Catholic national teachers, male and female, who are under the control of the priests and teach catechism in the churches, the parish priests as managers of the parochial national schools, having the power of dismissing the teachers. May it not be said of this great organization, adds Mr. McCarthy, that it is on a scale such as few nations would be able and willing to afford. To dispose of the indictment first, we may quote a little further from the author of it. He writes, so far as they are individually concerned, they, the priests, are in many cases the true friends of the people. They help them in their affairs, settle their disputes, claim for them their rights, comfort them in their sorrows, admonish, encourage, cherish, and watch over them. This is at the best. At the worst they are hard and cruel, selfish and unjust, overeating and overdrinking, a grotesque and monstrous company. But these are the minority, and on the whole the priests perform the duties of a dreary life as well as could be expected of a narrow and half-educated class of men. Now, if this means anything at all, it means that the person responsible for it believes that the Catholic priesthood of Ireland is socially useful and necessary. The minority of its members are hard and cruel, selfish and unjust, which is true of the minority of other priesthoods besides the Irish. But the majority are the true friends of the people, helping them in their affairs, settling their disputes, claiming for them their rights, comforting them in their sorrows admonishing, encouraging, cherishing, and watching over them. How the majority manages to accomplish so much, if it is composed of a narrow, half-educated class of men, passes comprehension. But we have the fact that it manages it, which is satisfactory. Further, our friend omits in the plenitude of his deprecation to mention that the religious vocation in Ireland is by no means the softest, easiest, and rosiest of vocations amounting, indeed, to a species of spiritual and physical servitude of the severest kind, and that the religious orders, so far as they may be represented in monasteries and nunneries, are self-supporting, subsisting austerely on the labor of their own hands, and devoting themselves to the most arduous, charitable, and educational work without fee or reward. And as to indecently rich houses of the church, such an epithet as applied to the Catholic churches of Ireland, is quite preposterous. There is no indecently rich Catholic church in all Ireland. That there are Protestant churches with incomes amounting to a comfortable number of hundreds per annum, and not a half a dozen souls in the way of a bona fide congregation, may be granted. But the Catholic church, with as little as a hundred pounds a year and no congregation, does not exist. Neither can it be maintained that the Irish Catholic churches are indecently rich in the matters of architecture or adornment. The long-drawn aisle and fretted vault, gorgeous windows, splendid altars and vessels, or other elaborate fitments, being the exception and not the rule. Indeed, our author himself complains that the ugliness of the churches in Ireland is revolting to the healthy sense, and that the decorations— which enshrine the mysteries of the Mass, are cheap and hideous, so that on his own showing, indecently rich somehow fails to fit in. Now for the figures. The population of Ireland at the last census was roughly 4,500,000, and the population of England and Wales, 32,500,000. In Ireland, there are three archbishops and 25 bishops without reckoning Episcopalians. In England and Wales, there are two archbishops, 33 bishops, eight assistant bishops, and 27 bishops suffragan, without reckoning one Roman Catholic archbishop and 15 bishops and the chiefs of the Wesleyan Methodist, Methodist New Connection, Primitive Methodist, Baptist, Congregational, 
free church salvation army church army calvinistic unitarian catholic apostolic and a host of other bodies in the matter of hierarchy therefore ireland is not exactly overburdened even if it be admitted that she should take her pattern from england then as against ireland's two thousand seven hundred twenty two secular priests england boasts the amazing total of twenty three thousand beneficed and unbeneficed clergy plus from seven thousand to ten thousand nonconformist ministers and twenty thousand salvation army officers so that at a moderate computation while there is one priest or minister of religion to every five hundred of the population in england there is only one priest to every eight hundred of the population of ireland the ratios indicated may not be exact but they are based on whittaker and pretty near the mark taken another way the position amounts to this in an english townlet of from three thousand to four thousand population you will find as a rule a couple of vicars three or four curates a wesleyan minister a baptist minister a congregational minister a catholic priest and a couple of salvationists in an irish townlet of the same size you have probably six catholic priests and a solitary episcopalian dreadful is it not being mainly of one sort as it were the priests of ireland appear to be much thicker on the ground than the clergy and ministers of england but it is nothing more nor less than an optical illusion one of those many illusions upon which judgments about ireland are usually formed as to places of worship it has been charged against the irish church that she builds too much the traveller walking or driving across the wastes of that empty land says the author previously quoted will nearly always find the first thing to break the monotony of the horizon is a spire or tower and when he arrives at the desolate little huddle of cabins or cottages that makes a town he will find dominating and shadowing it the catholic chapel sometimes indeed the buildings are poor and rough but these are becoming fewer and fewer and are now gradually even in the poorest districts being replaced by structures strangely out of keeping with the ruinous poverty around them the last few years have seen in ireland great activity in the building of these chapels the very slight increase which has taken place in the standard of living has made the movement possible assuming this to be a just statement of the case is it not equally true of our own england has not the building of churches chapels and general places of worship proceeded as merrily in the poorer districts of the larger english towns during the past decade as ever it did in ireland where can you turn in england without seeing a spire where is the townlet or suburb or slum that has not got its brand new red brick anglican church or its ruddy stone-fronted bethesda or its castellated prison-like salvation barracks furthermore the english temples are seldom half full you have to provide a sort of religious variety entertainment with services of song magic lantern sermons brass bands and the like to get the people in at all whereas the churches of ireland are full to overflowing and the congregations do not require the lore of a steady succession of novelties or indeed any departure from the prescribed offices the fact is that the irish church and the irish priesthood have been cruelly and brutally maligned by pretty well every sand-blind writer and carpet-bagging politician who has visited the country we have blamed upon the church poverty and distress and ignorance and squalor which are the direct outcome of bad government and not of priestly cupidity we have said in effect to our irish brethren you are too indigent to have a religion or churches or spiritual guidance every penny you pay for these things is sheer waste of money particularly as it keeps our rents down inasmuch as you are of one church and one mind which is a thing unthinkable in this free and enlightened england you are slaves and soulless but the church of ireland goes on its way and in the words of archbishop croke which by the way mr mccarthy irish catholic quotes with a sneer the irish priesthood 
holds possession of the people's hearts to a degree unknown to any other priesthood in the world. End of chapter 8 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 9 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 9 Morals. For all practical purposes, and in spite of everything that can be brought against her, Ireland may be justly described as a moral country. Even as Scotland is essentially an immoral country, and England a middling one. It is true that we live in a time when morality has ceased to matter and virtue is become a reproach. The world has divided itself into two camps, the one scientific, the other artistic. Neither of them professes the smallest concern with morals. We have invented new and most blessedly euphonious names for the old wickednesses. Robbery is called competition. Lying, smartness effrontery, pluck, cowardice, courtesy, avarice, thrift, cunning, wisdom, and so forth. And when it pleases us, we can e'en find hard names for the Christian graces. The faith of Ireland, for example, has been discovered to be fanaticism, bigotry, paganism, materialism, idolatry, and I know not what besides. Her charity is credited for her pusillanimity her patience and long-suffering for indolence and apathy. What wonder, therefore, that the very chastity upon which her national morals are based should at length have been assailed? Hearken to the inspired ex-literary editor of the Daily Mail. The crowning achievement of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland, the thing which is unparalleled elsewhere in the world, is the complete and awful chastity of the people. There is many a country district where that incident, which in England and Scotland is regarded merely as a slight misfortune, is unknown and unimagined by the people. I have seen a man, the father of a grown-up family, blanch and hold up his hands at the very name of it, as though even to breathe it were a blasphemy. And this in itself a good thing has reached such a point that it has become a dreadful evil. It is no longer a virtue. It is a blight, and the dear young gentleman goes on to assert that it is the chastity of the Irish people which fills Irish lunatic asylums, and exclaims dithrambically, there may be no bastards in Ireland, but a hundred bastards would, in Ireland's peculiar circumstances, be a more gracious and healthy sign than one lunatic. Here, surely, is wisdom of the highest and most delightful type. We have already seen that the increase of lunacy in Ireland has been pronounced by the committee, which sat on the question in Dublin, to be mainly due to excessive drinking and the assimilation of adulterated spirits. The committee may not have been right. For my own part, I believe it was decidedly wrong. But it delivered itself of no pronouncement which warrants either the scientific or the ribald to associate Irish lunacy with chastity, rather than with drink or other predispositions. If chastity fills the lunatic asylums, how come the Irish priesthood to be at large, or for that matter, the women of the English middle classes, and honest women all the world over? And if bastardy be a preventative of lunacy, how comes it that in Scotland you have as many lunatics as you have in Ireland, and about ten times as many bastards? Can it be that of the two evils Caledonia, with her customary shrewdness, has chosen both? The suggestion is as ridiculous as it is abominable, and as scandalous as it is malicious, even in the sense which our daily male young person may be presumed to have in mind it is the direct opposite of chastity that helps to people lunatic asylums, and never chastity itself, blight or no blight. I mention this wholly unprecedented incursion into sophistry only by way of showing what the astute censors of Ireland really can do when they set themselves to the work. And although I have no proof on the subject, 
I should like to wager that the author of it is an Orangeman, and of Scotch extraction. It is no compliment to Ireland to say that, in theory, at any rate, her morals are entirely sound. In other words, Ireland believes in virtue and goodness, even though she may not always succeed in living up to her tenet, and though for reasons which need not be discussed, she may be possessed of primal dispositions to the sorriest evil. And it is the solemn and deplorable fact that there does exist in the Irish blood a tendency toward wickedness of the most ghastly and inhuman character. A case in point is afforded by the frightful doing to death of Mrs. Bridget Cleary at Bally in 1895. The following account of this tragedy is abridged from Mr. McCarthy's Five Years in Ireland. Mrs. Cleary fell ill on Wednesday, the 13th of March, and sent for a doctor and a priest. The priest saw her in the afternoon. She was in bed, and she did not converse with him except as a priest, and her conversation was quite coherent and intelligible. The doctor also saw her, thought her illness slight, prescribed for her, and left. On the morning of Thursday the 14th, Father Ryan was called to see Mrs. Cleary again, but he told the messenger that, having administered the last rites of the church on the previous day, there was no need to see her again so soon. William Simpson, a near neighbor of the Clearies, living only two hundred yards off, accompanied by his wife, left their own house between nine and ten o'clock on Thursday evening to visit Mrs. Cleary, having heard she was ill. When they arrived close to Cleary's house, they met Mrs. Johanna Burke, accompanied by her little daughter, Katie Burke and inquired from her how Mrs. Cleary was. Mrs. Burke herself, a first cousin of Mrs. Cleary, said, They are giving her herbs got from Ganny over the mountain, and nobody will be let in for some time. These four people then remained outside the house for some time, waiting to be let in. Simpson heard cries inside, and a voice shouting, Take it, you bastard, you old faggot, or we'll burn you. The shutters of the windows were closed and the door locked. After some time the door was opened, and from within shouts were heard, Away she go! Away she go! As Simpson afterward learned, the door had been opened to permit the fairies to leave the house, and the adjuration was addressed to those supernatural beings. In the confusion, Simpson, his wife, Mrs. Burke and her little daughter worked their way into the house. Simpson saw four men, John Dunn, described as an old man, Patrick Kennedy, James Kennedy, and William Kennedy, all young men, big black-haired Tipperary peasants, brothers of Mrs. Burke and first cousins of Mrs. Cleary, holding Bridget Cleary down on the bed. She was on her back and had a nightdress on her. Her husband, Michael Cleary, was standing by the bedside. Cleary called for a liquid and said, Throw it on her. Mary Kennedy, an old woman, mother of Mrs. Burke, and of all the other Kennedys present, brought the liquid. Michael Kennedy held the saucepan. The liquid was dashed over Bridget Cleary several times. Her father, Patrick Boland, was present. William Ahern, described as a delicate youth of sixteen, was holding a candle. Bridget Cleary was struggling, vainly, alas, on the bed, crying out, Leave me alone! Simpson then saw her husband give her some liquid with a spoon. She was held down by force by the men for ten minutes afterward, and one of the men kept his hand on her mouth. The men at each side of the bed kept her body swinging about the whole time, and shouting, Away with you! Come back, Bridget Boland! In the name of God! She screamed horribly. They cried out, Come home, Bridget Boland! From these proceedings, Simpson gathered that they thought Bridget Cleary was a witch, or had a witch in her, whom they endeavored to hunt out of the house by torturing her body. Some time afterward she was lifted out of the bed by the men, or rather demons, and carried to the kitchen fire by John Dunn, Patrick, William, and James Kennedy. 
Simpson saw red marks on her forehead, and someone present said they had to use the red poker on her to make her take the medicine. The four men named held poor Bridget Cleary in her nightdress over the fire, and Simpson could see her body resting on the bars of the grate where the fire was burning. While this was being done, we learned that the rosary was said. Her husband put her some questions at the fire. He said if she did not answer her name three times, they would burn her. She, poor thing, repeated her name three times after her father and her husband. Are you Bridget Boland, wife of Michael Cleary, in the name of God? I am Bridget Boland, daughter of Patrick Boland, in the name of God. Simpson said they showed feverish anxiety to get her answers before twelve o'clock. They were all speaking and saying, Do you think it is her that is there? And the answer would be, Yes, and they were all delighted. After she had answered the questions, they put her back into bed, and the women put a clean chemise on her, which Joanna Burke aired for her. She was then asked to identify each person in the room, and did so successfully. The Kennedys left the house at one o'clock to attend the wake of Cleary's father, who was lying dead that night at Killinall. Dunn and Ahern left at two o'clock. It was six o'clock in the morning of the 15th after daybreak when the Simpsons and Johanna Burke left the house after those hellish orgies. There had been thirteen people present in Cleary's house on that night, yet no one outside the circle of the perpetrators themselves seems to have known or cared if they knew of the devilish goings-on in that laborer's cottage. At one time, during that horrible night, the poor victim said, The police are at the window. Let ye mind me now. But there were no police there. We now come to the third day. Friday, 15th of March. Six o'clock on that morning found Michael Cleary, the chief actor, Patrick Boland, and Mary Kennedy in the house with the poor victim, when the two Simpsons and the two Burks were leaving. Simpson says Cleary then went for the priest, as he wanted to have Mass said in the house to banish the evil spirits. This brings us back again to the Reverend Father Ryan, who says, At seven o'clock on Friday morning I was next summoned. Michael Cleary asked me to come to his house and celebrate Mass. His wife had had a very bad night. Father Ryan arrived at the cottage at a quarter past eight and said Mass in that awful front room where poor Bridget Cleary was lying in bed. She seemed more nervous and excited than on Wednesday, he says, and adds her husband and father were present before Mass began, but I could not say who was there during its celebration. He had no conversation with Michael Cleary as to any incident which had occurred because he suspected nothing. When leaving, he said, I asked Cleary, was he giving his wife the medicine the doctor ordered? Cleary answered that he had no faith in it. I told him that it should be administered. Cleary replied that people may have some remedy of their own that could do more good than doctor's medicine. Yet Father Ryan left the house suspecting nothing. Had he any suspicion of foul play or witchcraft, he says, he should have at once absolutely refused to say mass in the house and have given information to the police. After Father Ryan had said his mass and left, Mrs. Cleary remained in bed. Simpson saw her there at midday and never saw her afterward. His excuse for his presence and non-interference on Thursday night is that the door was locked and he could not get out. We find the names of still more people mentioned as having visited her this day. She seems, judging from the number of visitors, to have been extremely popular. Johanna Burke seems to have been in the house the greater part of this day. At one time she tells how Cleary came up to the bedside and handed his wife a canister and said there was twenty pounds in it. She, poor creature, took it, tied it up, and told her husband to take care of it, but he would not know the difference till he was without it. She was in her right mind, only frightened at everything. At length the night fell upon the scene, 
and at eight o'clock cleary who seems to have ordered all the other actors about as if they were hypnotized sent johanna burke and her little daughter katie for thomas smith and david hogan smith says we all went to cleary's and found michael cleary mary kennedy johanna mira pat Leahy, and pat boland in the bedroom the husband had a bottle in his hand and said to the poor bewildered wife will you take this now as tom smith and david hogan are here in the name of the father son and holy ghost tom smith a man who said he had known her always since she was born then inquired what was in the bottle and cleary told him it was holy water poor bridget cleary said yes and she took it she had to say before taking it in the name of the father son and holy ghost which she did smith and hogan then left the bedside and went and sat at the fire cleary told them that his wife as she had company was going to get up she actually left her bed and put on a frock and shawl and came to the kitchen fire the talk turned upon bishogs or witchcraft and charms smith remained there till twelve o'clock and then left the house leaving michael cleary husband patrick boland father mary kennedy aunt patrick james and william kennedy cousins johanna burke and her little daughter katie also cousins behind him in the house thomas smith never saw bridget cleary after that according to johanna burke they continued talking about fairies and poor bridget cleary sitting there by the fire in her frock and shawl wan and terrified had said to her husband your mother used to go with the fairies that is why you think i'm going with them did my mother tell you that exclaimed cleary she did that she gave two nights with them replied she johanna burke then said she made tea and offered bridget cleary a cup but cleary jumped up and getting three bits of bread and jam said she would have to eat them before she could take a sup he asked her as he gave her each bit are you bridget cleary wife of michael cleary in the name of the father son and holy ghost the poor desolate young woman answered twice and swallowed two pieces we all know how difficult it is when wasted by suffering and excited by fear to swallow a bit of dry bread without a drop of liquid to soften it it in fact was the task set to those in the olden days who had to undergo the ordeal by bread how many of them we are told failed to accomplish it poor bridget cleary failed now at the third bit presented to her by the demon who confronted her she could not answer the third time he forced her to eat the third bit he threatened her if you won't take it down you go he flung her to the ground put his knee on her chest and one hand on her throat forcing the bit of bread and jam down her throat swallow it swallow it is it down is it down he cried the woman burke says she said to him mike let her alone don't you see it is bridget that is in it and explains he suspected it was a fairy and not his wife let burke now tell how the hellish murder was accomplished michael cleary stripped his wife's clothes off except her chemise and got a lighted stick out of the fire and held it near her mouth my mother mary kennedy brothers patrick james and william kennedy and myself wanted to leave but cleary said he had the key of the door and the door would not be open till he got his wife back they were crying in the room and wanting to get out this crowd in the room crying while cleary was killing their first cousin in the kitchen i saw cleary throw lamp oil on her when she was burning she turned to me imagine that face of woe and called out oh hen hen i endeavored to get out for the peelers my brother william went up into the other room and fell in a weakness and my mother threw easter water over him 
Bridget Cleary was all this time burning on the hearth, and the house was full of smoke and smell. I had to go up to the room. I could not stand it. Cleary then came up into the room where we were and took away a large sack bag. He said, Hold your tongue, Hannah. It is not Bridget I'm burning. You will soon see her go up into the chimney. My brothers, James and William, said, Burn her if you like, but give us the key and let us get out. While she was burning, Cleary screamed out, She is burned now. God knows I did not mean to do it. When I looked down into the other room again, I saw the remains of Bridget Cleary lying on the floor on a sheet. She was lying on her face, and her legs turned upward, as if they had contracted in burning. She was dead and burned. There is nothing which quite parallels the foregoing in the whole history of crime. At least a dozen persons, male and female, had knowledge of what was going on in that dreadful household over three days. Not one of them had bowels of compassion. Not one of them lifted a little finger in the victim's behalf. The majority of them were her blood relations. All of them were Catholics. Not one of them but could have informed the priest, the doctor, or the police of what was taking place had he or she been so minded. But the devilish poison, raging in the blood of the woman's husband, raged also in their veins. They stood fascinated in the presence of superstitions which they had drawn in with their mother's milk. They believed in their hearts that Cleary and themselves were righteously, if terribly, occupied. They said the rosary, and they did all things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. End of chapter 9 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 10 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson T.W.H. Crossland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon Chapter 10 Pretty Women The women of England, not to say of Scotland, have of late years lain under the reproach that they are ceasing to be possessed of the fatal gift of beauty. I am well aware that there is not a reviewer exercising his calling between Land's End and John O'Groats who will not profess to foam at the mouth on the strength of this statement. Yet the fact remains that ugliness is rapidly becoming the common heritage of English women and Scotch women alike. There is an old superstition not of course tolerable to the minds of the smart people of today, that wickedness, or not to put too fine a point upon it, ugliness of temperament, is calculated gradually to induce ugliness of physique. Without going into the question of the general wickedness of Anglo-Saxon femininity, we may put it down for a scientific fact that the beauty of them is wearing away. Let us hope to the land of the leal. In those remarkably aesthetic organs which sell fifty process block portraits per week for sixpence, we are treated continually to what the editors take for types of English beauty. You pay your sixpence, and you open your hot-pressed beauty show. On the first page, that is, of course, after the advertisements, you have a speaking presentment of something with elaborate hair and an inexhaustible fund of torso which frankly might pass very well for a sign to a public house called the Bald Face Stag. Beneath you read in capital letters Miss or Mrs. So-and-so, the famous beauty. No woman in England apparently is allowed to know whether she be beautiful or not, until either Mr. Kebble Howard Bell or Mr. J. M. Bullock has so labeled her. Bell and Bullock being, of course, the only possible judges of feminine beauty England possesses. In the politest circles, it is quite dangerous to praise a woman's good looks without reference to the files of the sketch and the tattler. A certain nobleman, however, is understood to have earned something of a reputation for himself as connoisseur to openly avowing his contempt for both sheets and surreptitiously swatting up the picture pages of the Daily Mirror. 
this however like the daily mirror is probably neither here nor there the solemn fact remains that the beauty of england's fairest daughters and scotland's bonniest lasses alike has become a doubtful quantity any person who is troubled with qualms on the subject need only visit a court or an opera or messrs peter robinson's or an a b c shop or a mother's meeting hard faces bleary eyes saw teeth humpy shoulders and an undignified gait not to mention greasy complexions scanty hair bony hands and knock knees are the rule and not the exception among english womankind we have scarcely a beauty left even at the gaiety theatre in fact leaving out the ravishing pictures of the illustrated press there are really only two beautiful women in england and both of these are married to reviewers now i say and maintain that any male person possessed of an eye for the charms of what is commonly called the opposite sex will find that in ireland the decay of female beauty has not yet commenced whether he be in dublin or in cork in sligo or in limerick pretty women take his vision as the daffodils take the winds of march at every corner in fine it may be said without exaggeration that if ireland possesses a characteristic which renders her entirely different from the countries to which on the face of it she displays a sort of second-hand tumble-down resemblance it is the prettiness of her women i take it for granted that this trait has been commented upon by other travellers but i do not think that it has heretofore been in any sense properly impressed upon the public mind it is generally understood among artists that irish women have delicate hands and an eye with a sparkle about it irish poets in more or less halting english verse have done their best to indicate that irish women are to say the least of it worth looking at but i am not aware that on the whole the literature about ireland exists to anything like a reasonable degree on the beauty of irish women if the present work were from the exquisite pen of mr arthur simons our failure adequately to portray the beauty of erin's daughters would no doubt be counterbalanced by the insertion of a selection of half-tone portraits of representative specimens as it is we are compelled to admit that words fail us and that even if we cared to employ them the process blockmakers would fail us also it may be said roughly that the beauty of an irish woman while quite tangible and perfect to the vision is an elusive matter when one comes to cold type the anglo-saxon beauty can be hit off in words quite as handily as she can be hit off in paint what she amounts to as a rule is pink and white and yellow hair or mouse-coloured hair and a genteel pallidity but in ireland all this is different beauty of a witching and almost eerie quality is commonplace throughout the country an irishman will speak to you of the red-haired woman or that slip of a girl when he meets pieces of loveliness that titian might have given his eye teeth for a sight of in france at the present moment there is an artist who is understood to be making a fortune by drawing pretty faces he could find more subjects for his pencil in a day in dublin than he could find in a month in paris for this information i make no charge even mr gibson who appears to have invented a girl of his own might do very well out of the green country mr gibson's young lady is believed to typify the fairest that the united states of america can boast at times and when mr gibson is at his best she is undoubtedly a young woman of prepossessing appearance that she is also a truly american type may be taken for granted there are plenty of women in ireland however who come quite up to the gibson girl standard and for that matter beat it in journeying through the country i have been struck continually by the remarkable facial resemblance which exists between the irish and the american people in an irish railway train you see faces which at once give you the impression that you are at the hotel cecil the high cheekbones and lank-shaven jaw of the full-bodied american are here in great force and it is only when their possessors open their mouths that you can tell the difference 
of course the thing is accounted for by the fact that a very considerable proportion of the population of america is irish and that for a hundred years ireland has been sending her best blood to the states besides being comely the irish women have the advantage of what one may term an individual beauty in england you might rake together twenty beautiful blondes and twenty pretty brunettes and discover that they were merely blondes and brunettes and nothing more that is to say the blondes might readily pass for sisters and so might the brunettes both sorts lacking the ultimate gift of individuality irish women are different indeed you may safely say of them that they are all pretty and all different they never repeat their beauty there is nothing in the white rabbit or puss 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 about them and consequently they do not bore you as most things have a cause it seems possible that there are reasons for the beauty of irish womanhood for myself i should be disposed to ascribe it to the circumstance that the average irish woman be she rich or poor leads the life which a woman was intended to lead by the order of things namely the domestic life irish women are not without the wit to know that they are beautiful they have an armory of feminine allurements and wit enough to handle them with skill and they cannot be considered insensible to the fripperies which all women love but they do not make gaiety and ostentation the aim and end of their existence and they do not shirk the plain duties of womanhood in ireland though the women of the poorer classes have to work in the fields and undertake tasks which by good rights should be done by men there is absolutely no third sex the manly woman the emancipated woman and the impertinent flat-chested typewriter banger which so infest great britain are unknown even the irish sportswoman and as everybody knows she is pretty numerous retains her womanliness in a way that is quite beyond the horsey or doggy woman of the shires so that in one respect at least ireland may be reckoned something of a paradise end of chapter ten recording by john brandon chapter eleven of the wild irishman by thomas william hodgson t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon chapter eleven the london irish the irishman in london appears to lose a great deal of his lustre if you wish to see him at his best in this metropolis you must go to the bar if you wish to see him at his worst you must go to the house of commons and both best and worst are pretty bad the irishman at the bar shall not be named but all the world knows that they are a fairly ill-conditioned community savage rude reasonably illiterate and not in the least witty many of them model themselves on the late lord russell and come off accordingly others again are beefy and vulgar and notorious bullies the judicial bench does not include an irish judge possibly this is fortunate in london journalism the irish scarcely count mr w m thompson edits a sheet called reynolds newspaper to the complete satisfaction of mr clement shorter and mr t p o'connor edits t p s weekly and m a p both of them journals with which london could well afford to dispense as for irish reporters and sub-editors they are few and timid and well under the heel of the scotch who are numerous and rampant and unblushing in the minor professions such as physic publishing and stockbroking the irish do not figure at all impressively the truly great physicians of london are mostly scotch so thank heaven are the truly great publishers while the stockbrokers are commonly believed to belong to the tribe of manasseh of the politicians a great deal more has been written than the politicians are worth let us draw a decent green veil over them few englishmen nowadays know which of them is alive and which of them is dead 
neither can one tell offhand whether they are for the government or again it i have heard rumours of the existence in london of an irish literary society somewhere in holborn there exist too i am told an irish club so far as letters are concerned london is pretty well denuded of irishmen mr george moore no longer abides with us mr w b yeats has latterly preferred dublin to the euston road mr george bernard shaw has become an american playwright if these gentlemen are members of the irish literary society so much the better for the irish literary society there is an irish poetess resident in twickenham but whose who informs us that her celtic quality has not been stimulated by a sojourn in her native land the irish club would seem to devote itself to smokers socials and enjoyable evenings its saturnalia are duly reported in reynolds newspaper probably the most distinguished irishman in the metropolis is sir thomas lipton whose name is as prominently associated with sport as it is with tea then there are the irish guards one of the finest bodies of men in the king's service and mr dennis o'sullivan england's only irish actor it will thus be seen that the london irish do not shine effulgently none of them is at the top of things as it were none of them has got very far above the middling the reason no doubt is that the irish temperament is coy the scotchman who comes to london knows that he is an alien and an interloper and despised of his fellow men but he blusters it out the irishman on the other hand feels his position keenly and refuses to be other than diffident as a rule too he is without commercial aptitude and not vastly taken with the blessed word thrift besides which irishmen do not come to london in droves as do the scotch when they emigrate their natural tendency is toward america in any case it cannot be suggested that the london irish have at any time presumed to be aggressive neither have they made pretensions to superiority or exhibited a disposition to clannishness that they do not count is therefore probably their own fault for london in a greater degree perhaps than any other city in the world is always open to prostrate herself before the invader providing he be assertive and pushful enough leaving out the more or less eminent and glancing for a moment at the common rank of irishmen in london one is confronted with two facts and two facts only the first of them is that the london irish can muster in sufficient force to make a st patrick's day concert or so financially successful and the second is that the morning after the metropolitan magistrates have invariably to deal with a fairly noble batch of irish drunks practically this is all that is known by the cockney respecting his irish fellow-citizen and i think that it is distinctly unfortunate for ireland because it fosters a false impression the scotch who are wilier take great care not to get drunk on st andrew's day end of chapter 11 recording by john brandon Chapter Twelve of the Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter Twelve. Tom Moore. In the Treasury of Irish Poetry in the English Tongue, edited by Messrs. Stopford A. Brook and T. W. Wollaston, Thomas Moore is represented by eleven pieces to wit the song of fenula the irish peasant to his mistress at the mid-hour of night when he who adores thee after the battle the light of other days on music echo as slow our ship no not more welcome and my birthday 
I do not suppose for a moment that the editors intended to suggest that this selection represents in any sense the more popular of Moore's writings from the Irish point of view. Only two of the lyrics, indeed, namely, The Light of Other Days and As Slow Our Ship, are really well known among lovers of poetry, even in Ireland. We assume, therefore, that the remaining sets of verses have been inserted because, in the opinion of Mr. Stopford A. Brook and his co-editor, they are the best of more. Qua Poet in the English Tongue We quote here at length the Song of Finula. Silent, O Moyle, be the roar of thy water. Break not, ye breezes, your chain of repose, while murmuring mournfully lures lonely daughter tells to the night star her tale of woes when shall the swan her death note singing sleep with wings in darkness furled when will heaven its sweet bells ringing call my spirit from this stormy world sadly o moil to thy winter wave weeping fate bids me languish long ages away Yet still in her darkness doth Aaron lie sleeping, Still doth the pure light its dawning delay. When will that day star, mildly springing, Warm our isle with peace and love? When will heaven its sweet bells ringing Call my spirit to the fields above? As the devil might inquire, Is this poetry? I believe that I shall have with me the sounder critics when I say that it is small sentiment very carelessly set down. In sixteen lines we have quite a number of different measures, and Moore would seem to have labored under the impression that he was writing in one. In other words, the verses halt. As to the sentiment, nobody can question its utter banality. What a critic of Mr. Stopford Brooks' caliber can see in it, heaven alone knows. He might have got better verses and better sentiment out of any average breach of promise case. Nor are the remaining pieces much above the standard required by those eminent judges of poetry, the gentlemen who write more so for the drawing-room. For myself I venture the opinion that more lives on the strength of rich and rare were the gems she wore, the meeting of the waters, the harp that once threw Tara's halls. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms, the minstrel boy, the last rose of summer, and the Canadian boat song, most of which efforts have been set to music and are thereby materially aided to survival, so that on the whole Thomas More may not be reckoned as in any sense a purveyor of the higher kinds of poetry. It is credible, however, to the Irish people that they should have produced and put their emotional and moral trust in a Moore rather than a Burns. But morals on one side, Burns is immeasurably the greater poet, even though at times he wrote drivel of the feeblest sort. All the same it must be confessed that the general consent which keeps more at the head of the Irish poets, is sufficiently grounded. For weak vessel, though he may be, we do not find another Irish poet in the English tongue who could properly be placed above him. Write down, too, and including William Allingham, the history of Irish poetry in the English tongue has been the history of happy-go-lucky mediocrity. Even Mangan, who has latterly been credited with a share of the authentic fire, exhibits a facility, a slipshodness, and an aptness to the banal, which savor of the librettist. From his most considerable production, we take the following stanzas. The Nameless One Roll forth my song like the rushing river that sweeps along to the mighty sea. God will inspire me while I deliver my soul to thee. Tell thou the world when bones lie whitening amid the last homes of youth and eld, that there once was one whose veins ran lightning, no eye beheld. 
tell how his boyhood was one drear night hour how shone for him through his griefs and gloom no star of all heaven sends to light our path to the tomb roll on my song and to after ages tell how disdaining all earth can give he would have taught men from wisdom's pages the way to live and tell how trampled derided hated and worn by weakness disease and wrong he fled for shelter to god who mated his soul with song with song which always sublime or rapid flowed like a rill in the morning beam perchance not deep but intense and rapid a mountain stream tell how the nameless condemned for years long to herd with demons from hell beneath saw things that made him with groans and tears long for even death go on to tell how with genius wasted betrayed in friendship befooled in love with spirit shipwrecked and young hopes blasted he still still strove there may be lyrical impulse here but it is of quite an ordinary quality the much vaunted line about veins that ran lightning could i think be paralleled out of previous poets and the first half of it is clumsy and cacophonous night hour and light hour might have stepped straight out of the comic poets and the same may be said of years long and tears long which j k stephen would have chortled over for a metrical effect and when we come to still still strove we are among the librettists with a vengeance i have seen james clarence mangan collocated with poe if comparisons with america must be made we should range him alongside that bright spirit ella wheeler wilcox for sir samuel ferguson he has been highly praised by mr swinburne aubrey de vere and of course by mr w b yeats mr yeats pronounces him to be the greatest poet ireland has produced one who among the somewhat sybaritic singers of his day was like some aged sea king sitting among the inland wheat and poppies the savour of the sea about him and its strength hearken to the ancient sea king then dire was their disorder as a wavering line at first swayed to and fro irresolute then all disrupted burst like waters from a broken dam effused upon the plain the shelter of kilalta's woods and winding glens to gain but keen-eyed domnal when he stood to view the rout ere long spying that white unmoving head amid the scattering throng exclaimed of all their broken host one only man i see not flying and i therefore judge him impotent to be of use of limb go take alive he cried and hither fetch the hoary-haired unmoving man a swift battalion went and breaking through the hindmost line where Kellick sat hard by took him alive and chair and man up hoisting shoulder high they bore him back his hoary locks and red eyes gleaming far the grimmest standard yet displayed that day o'er all the war and grimly where they set him down he eyed the encircling ring of bishops and of chafing chiefs who stood about the king then with his crozier's nether end turned towards him bishop eric said wretch abhorred to thee it is we owe this bloody work by whose malignant counsel moved thy hapless nephew first sought impious aid of foreigners for which thou be accursed surely this is rank butterwoman's jog-trot to market the kind of thing perhaps that mr j hickory wood and mr arthur collins might joyously and jointly produce for the delight of the babies of england but for the greatest poet ireland has produced 
for the aged sea king sitting among the inland wheat and poppies it is poor poor stuff indeed of course i do not suggest that sir samuel ferguson who really was a scotchman not a sea king at all could not do better the fact however that the greatest poet ireland has produced managed to do so badly and was capable even of worse speaks at any rate a small volume for irish poetry the sole remaining irish poet worth troubling about is aubrey de vere and an examination of his work shows that while he persistently exercised himself on irish subjects and laid himself open to the charge of irish slackness and perfunctoriness he could write poetry of the kind which is entirely classic in its derivation but it is certain that he cannot be considered to have belonged to the far-famed celtic movement and that he was miles behind landor even in the severe classic vein i am afraid that broadly speaking ireland has not produced any poet of convincing greatness at all the treasury of irish poetry compared say with such a collection of english poetry as palgrave's golden treasury is a ghastly exhibition some of the moderns set forward by the editors have it is true accomplished work which is not without a certain distinction but the ancients thomas moore included are not for the reading of the discriminate indeed irish poetry in the english tongue is on the whole like ireland itself a decidedly tumble-down affair in a sense the genius of the country may be said to resemble the genius of japan that is to say while every irishman may be reckoned something of a poet in himself there are no irish poets just as while the japanese are all poets none of them has managed to evolve a respectable poem this i cannot help thinking is a pity for ireland and more to be sorrowed over than her lack of commercial aptitude than her poverty and than her wrongs there are those who tell us that the true poetry of the irish is hidden away in the memories of the peasantry taking the shape of gaelic folk songs ballads and so forth no doubt much may be said for this theory particularly as there is a gaelic league which seems to be making a good deal of impression upon certain sections of the people at the same time it seems remarkable that if the poetry of the gael be so rich and ornate and satisfactory as those who are able to read it would have us believe nobody takes the trouble to put it before us in a form calculated to preserve it the gaelic character is pretty enough and i have seen odd translations of gaelic poetry which promised rather well for the bulk yet it seems more than doubtful if the druid singers as i suppose mr yeats would call them ever had among their ranks a homer or for that matter an anacreon or a theocritus and talking of the gaelic league i should like to note for the entertainment of persons of humour that when i visited its establishment in dublin some months back i found the upper portion of the window occupied by a placard which announced in large roman letters that a well-known leaguer was about to open a shop in dublin object to push the sale of irish provisions people are human even in ireland End of chapter twelve Recording by John Brandon Chapter 13 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson T. W. H. Crossland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon Chapter 13 W. B. Yeats It might reasonably be supposed that the last drop in ireland's cup of bitterness was mr william butler yeats an emotional and misfortunate people with the tyrant's heel on its neck and poverty and disaster always in attendance upon it may be excused if it does not altogether dance to the pipings of a pretty fellow like mr yeats in point of fact however ireland fails to dance not because of her sadness but because mr yeats's minstrelry is to all intents and purposes utterly alien to her 
in england or more correctly speaking in london it is true that there have been and possibly is now a small cult of what is commonly called a celtic muse and the head in front of it of course is mr yates he has found ardent if undiscriminating support among the irish reporters and reviewers on the daily papers he enjoys the patronage of mr clement shorter and he is received respectfully at the irish literary club further i am told that there is a musically minded elocutionist in london who goes about chanting his numbers to the three-stringed psaltery that mr yates is a poet of some parts nobody in his senses would attempt to deny that he is a vast or potent or as he himself would no doubt phrase it a druid poet i am not disposed to admit the strength of him is slight indeed the thought of him prattles forever round the trivial he has a still small voice with a wistfulness about it and it is on this wistfulness that he has builded up his business his contemporaries the men among whom whether he likes it or no he will always have to range are every one of them stronger men than he they are ruder and more forceful more gusty and less attenuated if only by fits and starts they do their best to try to belong to the great british poetical tradition they fail lamentably but their work bears marks of aspiration mr yates on the other hand has been particular to pose on a little hill of his own he imagines that he has discovered a sort of private tradition the which he calls celtic out of ireland he believes himself to have captured druid music and this he has put up for us in sundry lyrical pieces and sundry plays his lyrical pieces are admired in all the drawing-rooms and all the sub-editors rooms and his plays have been stamped with the heartfelt approval of the chief secretary for ireland and mr max beerbaum the general opinion of him may be summed up in three words how charmingly celtic it is an old contention of mine that mr yates's qualities are not celtic at all i go further and say that as a fact there are no celtic qualities which are not common in good english poetry the best celt we ever had was mr yates's own master one william blake who was sheer cockney mr yates is just blake spun out and overconscious the moon like a flower in heaven's high bower with silent delight sits and smiles on the night i would that we were my beloved white birds on the foam of the sea we tire of the flame of the meteor before it can fade and flee and the flame of the blue star of twilight hung low on the rim of the sky has awakened in our hearts my beloved a sadness that may not die sweet babe in thy face soft desires i can trace secret joys and secret smiles little pretty infant wiles as thy softest limbs i feel smiles as of the morning steel o'er thy cheek and o'er thy breast where thy little heart doth rest i told my love i told my love i told her all my heart trembling cold in ghastly fears ah she did depart soon after she was gone from me a traveller came by silently invisibly he took her with a sigh beloved gaze in thine own heart the holy tree is growing there from joy the holy branches start and all the trembling flowers they bear the changing colours of its fruit have dowered the stars with merry light the surety of its hidden root has planted quiet in the night which is blake and which is yeats he may put the name of either under any of those stanzas without being guilty of an unpardonable critical lapse mr yates took blake and imitated him as frankly and it may be as unconsciously as many less sophisticated versifiers 
have imitated Tennyson or Mr. Swinburne or Rossetti. It is credible to him that he should have had discernment enough to perceive in Blake an exceptional and individual content. But why, having got hold of that content, having saturated himself with it, as it were, and having found the exploitation of it easy and provocative of praise, Mr. Yeats should turn round and call it Celtic is something of a puzzle. Of course, one has to remember that among a people whose interests are material rather than spiritual, the poet who would get a hearing is compelled to have resort to a certain amount of adventitiousness and empiricism. We poets in our youth begin in gladness, but thereof come in the end despondency and madness. Saith Wordsworth, We poets in our youth also begin in sincerity and with a single eye to the glory of the muses. But too frequently, even while our youth is still with us, we begin to think about the glory of ourselves and take steps accordingly. It is good for us, if we have any gift at all, to organize and advertise a school, with ourselves carefully elected by ourselves to the position of archpriest. The critic who in an idle hour set down Cockney School has a great deal to answer for. Somebody followed him hard with the Lake School, and in due course we had the Fleshy School. It is to be noted, however, that these epithets were bestowed by the critics upon the poets, and not by the poets upon the poets themselves. I venture to suggest that it has been slightly different in the case of Mr. Yeats and his following. In Mr. Yeats' mind, perhaps without his being wholly alive to it, something like the following has taken place. To be of any account in this world, a poet must have a quality or cry of his own. There is a quality or poignancy of individualism about Blake which has not yet become obvious to the multitude. I admire it, and I can imitate it, and possibly improve upon it. Therefore, let me adopt it for my own. And, as I am an Irishman, I shall cause it to be known not as the spirit of Blake, but as the Celtic quality, Sela. I do not suggest for a moment that Mr. Yeats's conduct in this matter has been either wicked or unjustifiable. I do not even suggest that Mr. Yeats has been quite aware of what he was doing. But not to put too fine a point upon it, I do say that he has been modern, and that it is a thousand pities. There is nothing in Ireland, and there never has been anything in Ireland, which will justify the appropriation of Blake as a sort of exclusive Irish product. And Mr. Yeats has written nothing which he could not have written just as well had he been a Cockney or a Hebrew capable of appreciating the spiritual and technical parts of Blake and of perceiving the beauty of certain scraps of Irish history and folklore. As an Irish poet, Mr. Yeats, in my opinion, fails completely. It is as reasonable to call him an Irish poet as it would be to call Milton a Hebrew poet, because he wrote Paradise Lost, or Mr. Swinburne a Greek poet, because he wrote Atalanta. There is not an Irishman, qua Irishman, who wants Mr. Yeats any more than there is an Irishman, qua Irishman, who wants Mr. Yeats Irish literary theater. Mr. Yeats' poetry and Mr. Yeats' Irish literary theater are Blake's poetry and Blake's literary theater. They belong to the Euston Road and not to Tara. They are cultivated, wary, wistful, minor English, and not Irish at all. You have to be English and a trifle subtle at that to get on with them. Blake's laurels are very posthumous and recent because the Englishman of his time was busy with Pope and Crabbe and had a sort of suspicion that Wordsworth was a lunatic. Englishmen did not know even Shakespeare in those days, at any rate not in the way we know him nowadays. To the Pope suckled Englishman of culture, Shakespeare, if he was anything at all, was a sort of robustious and flowery dramatist. They played him in full-bottomed wigs and small clothes. 
Today the tendencies are all the other way. Shakespeare, we shall tell you, was no playwright, but a poet, and the biggest of them. Our modern actors spoil him for us, not by their cuts and modifications, but by their rarey shows and mouthings. Who of them can say for you to your soul's satisfaction? Oh, here will I set up my everlasting rest, and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-weary flesh. Shakespeare is for all time and more and more for the closet. Blake is a greater poet than the critical are disposed to admit, even in this age of tender enthusiasms. And Mr. Yeats is a poet, not because he is Irish or Celtic, but in so far and precisely as far as he has had the good sense to take Blake for his master. For Celticism, as it is understood by its professors, Shakespeare abounds in it. First Lady Come, my gracious lord, shall I be your playfellow? Ma'am? No, I'll none of you. First Lady Why, my sweet lord? Ma'am? You'll kiss me hard and speak to me as if I were a baby still. I love you better. Second lady, and why so, my lord? Ma'am, not for because your brows are blacker, yet black brows, they say, become some women best, so that there be not too much hair there, but in a semicircle or half moon made with a pen. Second lady, who taught you this? Ma'am, I learned it out of women's faces. Pray now. What color are your eyebrows? First lady. Blue, my lord. Ma'am? Nay, there's a mock. I have seen a lady's nose that has been blue, but not her eyebrows. Second lady. Hark ye, the queen your mother rounds apace. We shall present our service to a fine new prince one of these days, and then you'd wanton with us if we would have you. First lady, she is spread of late into a goodly bulk. Good time encounter her. Her? What wisdom stirs amongst you? Come, sir, now, I am for you again. Pray you sit by us and tells a tale. Ma'am, merry or sad shalt be. Her, as merry as you will. Ma'am, a sad tale's best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. Her. Let's have that, good sir. Come on, sit down, come on, and do your best to frighten me with your sprites. You're powerful at it. Ma'am. There was a man. Her. Nay, come sit down, then on. Ma'am. Dwelt by a churchyard. I will tell it softly. Yon crickets shall not hear it. Her, come on then, and gift in mine ear. There is enough Celtic quality here, surely, to satisfy both Mr. Yates and Mr. Shorter. In fine, this tidy episode, out of a winter's tale, is quite as good and quite as Celtic as anything the Blake School, to give it its honest title, has managed hitherto to produce. What the average Irishman would think about it is another story. It is a pity to take from Ireland even a trifle over which she might, not improperly, loom herself. But Mr. Yeats, in the figure of Irish poet, reminds us of nothing so much as a peacock butterfly, purchased in the chrysalis state out of France by the careful entomologist, hidden in a plant pot at his parlor window, and slaughtered and labeled British, so soon as it has had time to spread its wistful wings. End of chapter 13 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 14 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson T. W. H. Crossland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 14 Wit and Humor. It has been remarked by a certain hawker of platitudes that humor is that which makes a man laugh. There have been several definitions of wit, one of them by Sidney Smith, and all of them more or less wanting in completeness. But in a general way, nobody is particularly keen on definitions, provided they can get for their amusement and exhilaration either humor or wit. During the past few decades, we have heard a vast deal of the advantages which accrue from the possession of what is called a sense of humor. The special sense of faculty for appreciating a joke is nowadays cultivated and consciously cultivated by all sorts and conditions of people. The gravest and most reverend persons are wont to enliven their conversation or their discourse with quips, cranks, jibes, and other sallies ingeniously calculated to set the listener in a roar. The House of Commons has latterly appeared to be filled with gentlemen who live to amuse each other. There are judges who seem almost incapable of opening their mouths without attempting the hilarious, and even bishops and bankers must have their little joke. The press also strains after humorsomeness in every degree, and when critics wish to be particularly severe, they write simply, Mr. So-and-so has no sense of humor. And here, in effect, we have what I conceive to be another distinct injustice to Ireland. For Irish wit and humor have passed into a tradition, and are believed by good judges to be the very wittiest and most humorous wit and humor the gods are likely to vouchsafe to us. In the course of years, many fairly thick volumes have been compiled out of the abundance of humorous material Ireland has furnished forth. To turn to such a volume, however, is, in my opinion, to experience a certain disappointment. There are jokes, it is true, and jokes innumerable, but somehow, for the modern laughter-seeker, there is a distinct flatness about them. Furthermore, they are nearly all chestnuts, a fact which renders it pretty plain that the people of Ireland have come to a full stop, as it were, and cease to produce them. I subjoin a few examples, called haphazard, from a book published so recently as last year. A prisoner was trying to explain to a judge and jury his innocence of a certain crime. It's not meself, he cried, as'll be after trying to deceive your honours. I didn't hit the poor dead gentleman at all, at all. It was him that struck the blow, and the exertion killed him. And what's more, I wasn't there at the time. I perceive, observed the judge, you're trying to prove an alibi. An alibi? exclaimed the prisoner, evidently pleased at the big word being suggested to strengthen his defense. Yes, said the judge. Can you tell me what is a good alibi? Faith, your honor, replied the prisoner, and it's a loy boy which the prisoner gets off. What passed between yourself and the complainant? inquired the magistrate in the county court. I think, sir, replied the worthy O'Brien, a half dozen bricks and a lump of paving stone. I say, Paddy, said a tourist to his car driver, that is the worst looking horse you drive I ever saw. Why don't you fatten him up? Fat him up, is it? queried the Jehu. Face, the poor baste, can hardly carry the little mate that's on him now. Have you had any experience with children? inquired a lady of a prospective nurse. Oh, yes, mum, replied the woman blandly. I used to be a child meself once. A Jarvie who was driving through the streets of Dublin met with an obstruction in the shape of a man riding a donkey. Now then, you two, he exclaimed. An Irish member named Doherty, who subsequently became Chief Justice of Ireland, asked Canning what he thought of his maiden speech. The only fault I can find with it, said Canning, is that you call the speaker, sir, too often. My dear fellow, replied Doherty, 
if you knew the mental state i was in while speaking you would not wonder if i called him mum get on man get on said a traveller to his car driver wake up your nag sure sir was the reply i haven't the heart to bait him what's the matter with him inquired the traveller is he sick no sir answered the jarvey he's not sick but it's unlucky he is sir unlucky you see sir every morning before i put him in the car i tosses him whether he'll have a feed of oats or i'll have a drink of whisky and the poor baste has lost five mornings running did you notice no suspicious character about the neighborhood said a magistrate to an inexperienced policeman sure your hanner replied the policeman i saw but one man and i asked him what he was doing there at that time of night says he i have no business here just now but i expect to open a jewelry store in the vicinity later on at that i says i wish you success sir yes said the magistrate and he did open a jewelry store in the vicinity later on and stole seventeen watches begorra your honour answered the constable after a pause the man may have been a thief but he was no liar bridget i don't think it's quite the thing for you to entertain company in the kitchen don't ye worry mum sure and i wouldn't be after depriving ye of the parlour an old lady in dublin weighing about sixteen stone engaged a car driver to convey her to a north wall steamer arrived there she handed the driver his legal fare sixpence gazing disconsolately at the coin in his hand and then at the fat old lady he exclaimed as he turned away i lave ye to the almighty mum prisoner demanded the magistrate of a man charged with begging have you any visible means of support yes your honour replied the prisoner and then turning to his wife who was in court he said bridget stand up so that the court can see yez now it is plain that we have here a fairly representative selection of the kind of wit and humour that is supposed to come to us out of ireland some of it no doubt is reasonably good some of it is quite mild possibly it is amusing and calculated to tickle old-fashioned people yet one has distinct qualms about it when one considers it as a means of provoking the laughter of the twentieth-century person the fact is that humour has been made so much of a cult in the modern mind that it has to be very humorous indeed not to say a trifle subtle if it is to raise a smile and in considering the examples quoted we are faced with a further difficulty are these anecdotes of unquestionable irish extraction i am afraid not their authenticity is impeachable mutatis mutandis they have been told of cockneys and yorkshiremen and somersetshire men and even of scotchmen furthermore there is nothing in them that can be considered particularly and exclusively irish or indicative of the irish temperament and character as it exists today your modern irishman as i have pointed out is a dreary and melancholy white laughter and sprightliness have died out of him and whether in thought or word he is about as dull and plantigrade as even a sad man can well be the eminent people who stand for ireland in this country are all of them afflicted with a similar lack of cheerfulness rouse them and they can be as bitter and vituperative and aboriginal as any scotchman of them all but their ordinary habit is sad uncertain and inept and they do not know how to laugh here and there one of them at the bar or in the house of commons or at a greasy journalistic banquet does his feeble best to keep up the irish tradition for smartness and wittiness of remark but the attempt is invariably a failure because at the back of it there is no real brain and no real flow of spirits 
one of the biggest bullies at the bar is a beefy irishman who esteems himself a great humorist i have heard him fire off twenty or thirty idiotic jokes in the course of half an hour or so and always does he snigger at the beginning of his precious jibe always does he snigger in the middle always does he make pretense of becoming apoplectic with chortle at the end the circumstance that people laugh at him and not with him does not appear to occur to his small if legal mind his dearest friends call him the sniggerer and it is said that he is in the habit of retiring to his chambers of afternoons for the purpose of having a protracted fit of giggling primed with four or five glasses of cheap port his capacity for low comedy becomes so evident that one trembles lest some enterprising theatrical manager should offer him the leno welch part in next year's little goody two-shoes another witty irishman who shall be nameless came to these shores with a fair array of good gifts at his disposal knowing himself for an irishman and having faith in the irish tradition he forthwith set up in business as a posturing clown and professional grinner through horse collars with a result that his genius is altogether obscured irishmen of all degrees will do better if they endeavour to remember that they have really no sense of humour left the only one of them who has made anything like a satisfactory reputation in london mr w b yeats to wit has helped himself to it by being as devoid of humour as a boneyard mr yeats has never been known publicly to try his hand at the very smallest joke the sobriety of the hearse is his and much good sense also for the eminent irish as we know them among us are by nature neither witty nor humorous and those who try to be so succeed in being only fatuous and vulgar somebody has said cuttingly that a frenchman consists of equal parts of tiger and monkey of certain of the eminent irish in london it may be said that they are half jackal and half performing dog for they are at once hungry and fantastic End of chapter 14 recording by john brandon chapter 15 of the wild irishman by thomas william hodgson t w h crossland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 15 More Wit and Humor. The real truth about Irish humor, as a thing to itself and apart, is that it is based either on ignorance or on a certain slowness of mind. The Dublin car driver, who on being told by a constable that his name was obliterated from his car, replied, Ah, oh, me name's not obliterated it's o'grady no doubt achieved what will pass among the average for humour all the same he did not know that he was saying anything good and his mot if mot one may call it was the direct outcome of a profound ignorance of the english language the books of irish humour abound with instances of this form of humoursomeness you are not opaque are you sarcastically asked one irishman of another who was standing in front of him at the theatre indeed i'm not replied the other it's o'brien that i am clearly one might manufacture this kind of humour ad infinitum the chinese are said to consider it a great joke if a man should fall down and break his arm and i have seen englishmen laughing at a man who has been unfortunate enough to have his hat blown off in a high wind but the irish do not laugh at these things even the native bull of which they are so proud fails to tickle them the irishman says his bull solemnly and unconsciously and the englishman does the laughing in essence the irish bull is really a blunder not all with its usual frankness defines a bull as a ludicrous inconsistency or blunder in speech children and irishmen are always making them if it please the court quoth an irish attorney if i am wrong in this i have another pint which is equally conclusive an irish reporter giving an account of a burglary remarked after a fruitless search all the money was recovered except one pair of boots 
A Dublin clerk, on being asked why he was a quarter of an hour late at the office, made answer, The tram car I came by was full, so I had to walk. This is the seventh night you've come home in the morning, observed an Irish lady to her spouse. The next time you go out, you'll stay at home and open the door for yourself. The following advertisement is said to have appeared in a Dublin newspaper. Whereas John Hull has fraudulently taken away several articles of wearing apparel without my knowledge, this is to inform him that if he does not forthwith return the same, his name shall be made public. An Irishman who accidentally came across another Irishman who had failed to meet him after a challenge addressed him in these words, Well, sir, I met you this morning, and you did not turn up. However, I am determined to meet you tomorrow morning, whether you come or not. Drunk, said a man, speaking of his neighbor. He was that drunk that he made ten halves of every word. A man who was employed as a hod carrier was told that he must always carry up fourteen bricks in his hod. One morning the supply of bricks ran short, and the man could find but thirteen to put in his hod. In answer to a loud yell from the street, one of the masons on top of the scaffolding called out, What do you want? Throw me down one brick, bawled Pat, pointing to his hod, to make me number good. Of course the great and abiding glory of Ireland, in the way of bull-makers, was the never-to-be-forgotten Sir Boyle Roach. This worthy knight once charged a political opponent with being an enemy to both kingdoms, who wishes to diminish the brotherly affection of the two sister countries. He also said that a man differs from a bird in not being able to be in two places at once and that the Irish people were living from hand to mouth, like the birds of the air. A petition of the citizens of Belfast, in favor of Catholic emancipation, he stigmatized as an airy fabric based upon a sandy foundation, and he expressed his willingness to give up not only a part, but if necessary, even the whole of our Constitution, to preserve the remainder. In one of his most famous speeches there occurs the appended passage. Mr. Speaker, if we once permitted the villainous French masons to meddle with the buttresses and walls of our ancient constitution, they would never stop, nor stay, sir, until they brought the foundation stones tumbling down about the ears of the nation. If these Gallican villains should invade us, tis on that table, maybe, those honorable members might see their own destinies lying in heaps atop of one another. Here, perhaps, sir, the murderous crew would break in and cut us to pieces and throw our bleeding heads upon that table to stare us in the face. Is your father alive yet? inquired one O'Brien of one McGorry. No, replied McGorry solemnly, not yet. A beggar, called at a house and said, For the love of heaven, Mom, give me a crust of bread, for I'm so thirsty I don't know where I'll sleep tonight. All of which is very funny, and as who should say very quaint, but is it humor? It provokes a smile, certainly, yet it points to simplicity rather than subtlety in the Irish character. Indeed, the absolute truth about the bull is that it is the child of a plentiful lack of wit. A nice derangement of epitaphs, an opening of one's mouth and putting of one's foot in it, may provoke mirth in other people, but it does not prove one to be either witty or merry. It is satisfactory to know that according to the latest observations, the fine art of bull-making is going out of fashion among Irishmen. The Irish were the inventors of the bull. They brought it to its greatest perfection. They made it redound to their credit as a witty nation, and one cannot deny their right to cease from its manufacture, if they see fit. In the House of Commons, a bull is nowadays seldom perpetrated, whether consciously or unconsciously, at any rate by the Irish party. Irish members of Parliament have grown too wary to be caught bullying. 
They walk delicately in English-cut frock coats. They rather pride themselves on their ability to keep down the brogue, and at the bare mention of the word bull they are prone to shiver. There is one feature of Irish wit and humor which is worthy of admiration and imitation. It is a negative feature, truly, but an excellent one. Irishmen do not seem capable of that last infirmary of the doting mind, the pun. To play effectively upon words is, of course, an art in itself, and kept within bounds, it is an amusing art. But the man who drops out of art into sheer mechanism, which is what has happened to the average punster, cannot be considered worthy of the respect of his fellows. The Irish, as I have said, do not appear to have descended to these depths. They may be a worn-out, a weary, a dull-witted, an exhausted, and a brooding and melancholy people. But they are not punsters. Herein they have a distinct advantage over the English, among whom the pun appears to obtain wider and wider currency. It is a lamentable fact that there are judges on the English bench who never let slip an opportunity for punning. It makes juries and the gallery guffaw, and it gets a judge the reputation of being a wit and the possessor of those minor literary graces which are supposed to be included in the judicial prerogative. Judges are commonly understood to be irremovable, but I think that after their third pun retirement should be the only course for them. The man who makes a pun insults the intellect of his auditors and commits a gross outrage upon the language. Let all punsters, whether in high or low places, take heed that they are vulgar and vicious persons, and neither witty nor wise. A thousand honest bulls are less to be deprecated than the weeniest pun that was ever let loose. Before leaving this part of our subject, it is perhaps desirable that we should remember that two of the very wittiest men of our time have come to us from Ireland. One of them was the late Mr. Oscar Wilde, and the other is Mr. George Bernard Shaw. Of Oscar Wilde, excepting that in his prime he was a wit of the first water, I shall say nothing. Mr. George Bernard Shaw, however, is another story as a reformer and a serious writer, I make small account of him. On the other hand, as a wit, he is a portent. He has been an unconscionable time coming into his own. But in America, at any rate, people are beginning, by childlike dim degrees, to perceive that he has brilliance. If he had published the substance of his printed work in any other form but that of plays, he might have been a recognized and prosperous humorist long ago. The people who supply the wit and humor of the day may be set down, without injustice, for a sorry and indifferent company. Bernand, Payne, Emmanuel, Jerome, Lucas, Sims, Hickory, Wood, and Barry. These are some of the names of them. And what do they stand for? Parts of Punch, Eliza, Three Men in a Boat, the inside completor Britannia ware, O blood and knives, mustard and cress, or the fat man Sabbath morning, the white cat, or Cooper's entire, Peter Pan, or the old man's crutch. Heaven save us and keep us from wishing that this squad of awkward whittlings had never been born. Mr. George Bernard Shaw, in his sole person, an Irishman though he be, is worth a wilderness of them. Some day we shall find it out, and in that good hour Ireland will be able to boast that one of her sons was nearly as great, nearly as humorous, and nearly as popular as, say, Mr. Mark Twain. End of chapter 15 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 16 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 16 Dirt. I suppose that next to the Scotch, the Irish are out and out the dirtiest people on the earth. But whereas Scotch dirt is a crude and gross affair, Irish dirt 
has still a pathetic and almost tender grace about it dear dirty dublin sigh the emotional in such matters though you never catch anybody shedding a tear for remembrance of dear filthy glasgow dublin is indubitably a dirty city just as ireland is a dirty country and for irishmen at any rate the government is a dirty government and it is not because dublin or ireland is dirty of necessity or in the way that the black country or the east end of london are dirty not a bit of it dublin and ireland are dirty simply and solely because the dublin and irish people steadfastly refuse to keep them clean to all intents and purposes the irish people have lost if indeed they ever possessed that gift of punctilious domesticity which insists first and last and always on cleanliness in dublin you will come upon more dirty hotels and more dirty houses than in pretty well any other city of its size in europe true the dirt has the merit of not being too obvious and falling short of the scandalous but it is still there and you cannot get away from it properly looked into it recommends itself to you as the dirt of a happy-go-lucky neglectful behind-hand and poverty-stricken people rather than of a people who are flagrantly given over to dirt for its own sake it is the dirt of the slattern who is forever dusting things with her apron rather than of the stout idle-back for whom dust and grime and sloppiness have no terrors and no reproach it is a dirt which is the direct consequence of bad seasons the decay of trade monetary stringency and public and private listlessness and apathy it is the kind of dirt which one associates with the boarding-houses of elderly ladies who have seen better days ireland's better days have been few and far between and they would seem to be all past hence no doubt the dustiness and dinginess and shabby gentility of her parlours in an irish hotel dirt and its common concomitant tumble-downness are ever before you the floors clamour to be swept the furniture would give a day of its life for a polishing the wallpapers are faded and fly-blown there are cobwebs in the top corners and dust in the bottom corners the windows are rickety and perfunctorily cleaned the carpets infirm and old the linen worn and yellow with age the crockery cracked and chipped the cutlery dull and greasy and the general air of the place shabby and forlorn i do not say that there are no cleanly and spick and span hotels in dublin for there is at least one such establishment but in the main what one may term the semi-clean semi-dirty used to be kind of hotel prevails even the waiters though their hair be greased and their faces shine by virtue of vigorous applications of soap wear frayed and threadbare swallow-tails and a sort of perennial yesterday's shirt-front and what is true of the hotels is true of the houses there is a district between sackville street and the railway station which contains a very large number of the sombrest most forbidding and dirtiest-looking domiciles it has ever been my lot to come across formerly these houses were the homes of the easy and the well-to-do now they are let off in tenements to the poorest of the poor black and grinding poverty peeps out of the cracked and paper-patched windows of them groups of grubby bare-legged blue cold children huddle around their decrepit doors or scamper up and down the filthy pavements in front of them the places may be sanitary enough within the meaning of the acts but that they are filthy and foul to a nauseating degree no person can doubt such rookeries would be clean swept away by the authorities in any english city in dublin nobody seems to trouble about them or to be in the smallest sense disturbed by them they are a part and parcel of dear dirty dublin and haply dublin would not be dublin without them in the other irish cities and towns the same tendency to squalor and grime and filth is painfully noticeable 
even in a centre like Porta Down, which, be it noted, is Protestant and to a great extent new. The same undesirable traits assail you pretty well wherever you go. In a city set on a hill without a factory to its name, I found a blackness and a grime which reminded me of nothing so much as Gravesend or Stockport. The hotel in that same city was as crazy as it was chilly and comfortless. Pokey rooms and dark little passages, meager and dubious furnishings, and dirt, 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 from basement to attic. Yet the place seemed populous with cleaner wenches, floor scrubbers, and clout women. There was a boy in a green apron who appeared to do nothing all day but dust the banisters, and the waiters were eternally flicking the dust off things with their napkins. And such waiters, wall eyed, heated, fumbling, grumpy, and incompetent, they insisted on getting in one another's way and they had a gift of dilatoriness that amounted to genius. In this way, let me set down a small fact about the Irish waiter, which may perhaps save future travellers in Ireland some trouble. If you ask an English waiter for a timetable, he will bring it to you, and leave you to your own devices. If you ask an Irish waiter, he will say, Timetable? Yes, sir. Where will you be after going, sir? You are taken unawares, and quite foolishly. Tell him the name of the next town on your itinerary. Forthwith he informs you that there is a very good hotel there. Be the name of the Duke's head, and that the next train convenient goes at one thirty. Is it a quick train? Oh, yes. Will he see that your luggage is taken to the station in time to catch it? Certainly he will. You keep your mind easy and turn up at the station at one thirty. There is a train at one thirty, it is true, but unluckily for you, it does not go within a hundred miles of your place of destination. The train you ought to have caught went at ten thirty, and there is not another one till late at night. Well, if it be Saturday, you must wait till Monday morning, because there are practically no Sunday trains in Ireland. Do not imagine for a moment that your Irish waiter has misinformed you with malice aforethought, or out of a desire to lengthen your sojourn in his employer's hotel. Because this is not the case. He is merely an Irishman, and therefore a born blunderer, and he does his best to blunder every time. End of chapter 16 Recording by John Brandon Chapter Seventeen of the Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter Seventeen The Tourist. The tourist is the curse of Ireland, as he is the curse of most places. When one comes to consider the enormous number of grievances the Irish and their political figureheads have managed to rake up, one wonders that the tourist should hitherto have escaped. That he constitutes a grievance, and a grievance which affects seriously the main body of the Irish people, cannot be doubted. It is quite obvious, to begin with, that the tourist in Ireland is usually of the hated Sassanich race. Irishmen do not tour in their own country as Englishmen do, or as Scotchmen have been known to do. They have too little money for indulgences of that kind, and if money be plentiful, they prefer to visit England or America. The Englishman, however, insists on taking a holiday in Ireland some time in his life, even though it be only on his honeymoon, so that in the more suitable months the country bristles with tourists, and the great majority of them are English. Secondly, the tourist being English is always more or less hilarious, supercilious, and aggressive, and these are qualities of which the Irish of all people least like a display, at any rate from an Englishman. Time out of mind, the English tourist has been the covert bete noire 
of the continental peoples on account of these very traits an englishman on the continent especially if he be a middle-class englishman or a very wealthy englishman has a knack of divesting himself utterly of the thin veneer of social decency which he manages to maintain at home somehow the air of the continent exhilarates him to all sorts of posturing and ridiculousness the vulgarian the philistine and the snob in him become greatly emphasized he can shout aloud and be rude to everybody because he believes that nobody understands what he is pleased to call his lingo besides which the englishman on the continent always believes in his private bosom that he is a philanthropist a sort of circular touring benevolence as it were who is it he inquires grandiloquently that keeps these poor foreigners going why the english and the english alone it is we who bring millions of pounds to their starved tax-burdened countries it is we who populate their rapacious hotels and make their seasons for them and drop our idiot monies at their gambling tables and pay francs at the entrances to their art galleries and climb their rotten mountains and steam to soft lydian airs up their rivers and bathe in their lukewarm seas and tip them and patronize them and joke with them and generally afford them opportunities for existence this attitude has been noted and laughed at by the cynical time out of mind but it cannot be eradicated from the englishman's fairly comprehensive stock of idiosyncrasies and it remains to this day typical of the breed to ireland the english tourist proceeds focused for pretty well the same view of things of course he is disposed to look upon your irishman as being rather more of a man and a brother than is the low foreigner further he invariably believes that by a judicious expenditure on drinks coupled with an easy slap you on the back but still superior manner he can extract from the irishman with whom he comes in contact the whole secret of the irish question in other words he makes a point of going to ireland with his eyes open so that when he returns he may remark huskily in his club sir i have visited ireland and i know the irish people through and through waiter a large scotch please thus is the altruism of the tourist in ireland tempered with the taste for inquiry and politics i suppose that in no country in the world is the tourist allowed so much of his fling as in this same green errand for example in ireland he takes care to call every man pat and every woman kathleen mavornin if he called a frenchman froggy or a german johnny deutscher he would stand a good chance of getting his nose pulled but in ireland a bold peasantry has learned to smile and smile and touch the hat and take the coppers and provide the political information for which his honour is gasping without so much as turning a hair it is not really in the irish blood to take these travelling mountebanks with their loud suits and louder manners and louder money seriously or even indifferently on the other hand your true irish resent in their hearts the entire business it is their poverty and not their wills which consent though singularly enough as i have already said you will seldom find an irishman indulging himself in growls about it and it is this very poverty which might reasonably give rise to the irishman's third grievance against the tourist for an englishman travelling in ireland is always a sort of perambulating incitement to envy because of his apparent wealth he may be only a clerk out for a fortnight's rest and change on money squeezed out of the meagerest kind of salary yet to the penniless irishman he seems literally to be made of wealth and pat let us call him pat so that the tourist of this world may know whom we mean is not without certain reasoning powers of his own poverty-stricken though he may be it seems to me only human that he should reason about the english tourist 
in a way which brings him little comfort and throws considerable discredit on england he perceives that compared with himself the englishman is not altogether a person of genius or an angel of light his ignorance is appalling even to an irishman his manners are none of the choicest his capacity for eating and drinking borders on the marvellous pat notes these things and wonders he wonders why there should be such tremendous gulfs between loving subjects of the king he wonders where people who travel on cheap tickets get all their money he wonders how they manage to pay fifty pounds a rod for certain fishing or fifty pounds a gun for certain shooting he wonders why they cackle so about priestcraft and home rule and the development of industry he wonders whether they have really been elected by heaven to be a dominant people he wonders why he himself should have been given over to their governance and with all his wondering he is not consoled there is probably nobody to tell him that for irremediable reasons the irish are never likely to become a happy and prosperous nation there is nobody to tell him that this dazzling englishman is so much gross material with no tradition of spirituality at the back of him there is nobody to tell him that it is the british habit to think first and foremost of his own welfare and comfort and that it pities rather than admires those countries or persons who have been foredoomed to contribute to them therefore he goes on wondering without consolation and within him there is discontent and bitterness despite his outward subservience there has been very tall talk in sundry well-meaning circles as to the advantages which are to accrue to ireland from the development of her trade in tourists no doubt it is extremely heterodox to say so but for myself i incline to the opinion that the tourist business on its present lines is a snare and a delusion and a demoralization it takes money into the country certainly but it takes other things which are not by any means so desirable moreover that very money helps materially to cloud and confuse important issues the real condition of ireland as it is known to irish officialdom and as it should be known to englishmen is glossed over and hidden away as a direct result of the eleemosynary tendencies of the english tourist a people of the temper and parts of the irish people should be in position to live out of irish land and irish industry and not be in any serious sense dependent upon the fitful generosity of sightseers and problem solvers ireland has had far too much largesse both private and public the english tourist distributes his shillings the english government distributes its loans and other financial bolsterings up what is wanted is a fair field no favour for irish labour it will take many generations of tourists to provide for ireland any such good gift i do not believe that the government loans can provide either a newer and less rapacious and less unintelligent race of landlords might achieve it the bland benevolent money-dropping englishman who out of his generosity or his scheme of politics desires to assist the irish people should buy a place in ireland and do his best to live there the country is full of properties which would be cheap at treble the prices that are now being asked for them there is plenty of land and there is plenty of labor the land laws it is true seem on the face of them ridiculous that is to say if you happen to be a landlord whose eye is forever on the rent roll and the automatic improvement of properties at other people's expense but if on the other hand you are a comfortable high tory patriarchal landlord with bowels and a proper appreciation of sport and a proper interest in agriculture and the breeding of cattle ireland need have no terrors for you there is a notion abroad that the irish farmer has deep-rooted prejudices against landlords of whatever degree we are told that he is a confirmed shirker of the prime duty of rent paying and that he will let a holding go to rack and ruin for the sole purpose of cheapening its value so that he may himself buy it for the merest song 
the demand throughout the country we are told is for farmer and peasant proprietorship and the legislature has formulated wonderful machinery in the interest of such proprietorship my own view is that of two evils the irish cultivators have in this matter chosen the lesser on the one hand they have rack rents absentee landlords and agents who if they had bodies to be shot appear to have had very small souls to be saved on the other hand they have been offered schemes of purchase that sound very well but do not work out quite so well in practice still a bad scheme of purchase is better than bad landlords and worse agents an intelligent and reasonable landlord of bucolic tastes who will look as sharply after his agent or factor as he will look after his tenants on rent day could in my opinion do quite as well in ireland as he can do in england in a sentence ireland wants settling not touring end of chapter seventeen recording by john brandon chapter eighteen of the wild irishman by thomas william hodgson t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon chapter eighteen potatoes a gentleman who is universally applauded as a handler of the pencil and a smart after-dinner speaker lately remarked that if he were compelled to give up one of two things to wit tobacco or christianity he would give up christianity then with a slack-minded man's weakness he went on to explain that a christianity which prohibited tobacco would not be christianity at all when all things were made we are told nothing was made better than tobacco without being an anti-tobacconist without being a non-smoker without indeed being other than a great blower of the cloud it is quite reasonable for one to doubt whether on the whole tobacco is the blessing that modern man hold it to be there is no evidence to show that man's intellects have improved since the introduction of smoking it seems probable that the high water mark of british brains had been reached somewhat prior to the time in which james i had occasion to adorn polite letters with his notorious counterblast shakespeare did not smoke mitchum shag was nothing to ben jonson nor navy plug to milton it is our barry's and our j k jerome's and our f c ghouls who electrify the country with their pipes in their mouths now the person who is commonly credited with having introduced the art and practice of tobacco smoking into england is sir walter raleigh there is a legend that when the gentleman's servant first saw him smoking he rushed out for a bucket of water in the belief that his master was on fire by a strange coincidence it is the same sir walter raleigh who is commonly credited with having introduced the potato into ireland could sir walter raleigh's servant have perceived what black and fearsome troubles the potatoes in his master's pockets or other receptacle would one day call down upon the irish people it is conceivable that he might have rushed out for something even more drastic than a bucket of water the potato undoubtedly is an elegant fruit all men know that with beef mutton and flesh meats in general it is everything that could be desired as a staple article of food however it cannot be considered otherwise than as a flagrant and wicked mistake in ireland the potato has become a staple article of food whole generations of irishmen have battened upon it in good times with the addendum of a little buttermilk or a scrap of bacon in bad times with the addendum of a pinch of salt and as the times in ireland have been immemorially bad times the pinch of salt has been most frequently to the fore in plain times the irish people are a potato-fed people in theory the potato might well have been specially created by providence to fit in with the irish temperament the irish temperament has distinct tendencies in the direction of indolence the potato heaven be thanked is a tuber which does not demand too great a skill or too great an amount of labor in cultivation you cut it up dump it into the ground and it grows of itself also it is a prolific plant and will make more dead weight to the root than almost anything else that grows 
the which of course saves digging a peasant with a potato patch is believed to be wholly beyond the reach of hunger and his standard of emolument may conveniently be adjusted for him accordingly he himself is aware that it is out of his potato patch that he and his family have got to subsist and that all the rest is luxury of the most bloated order philosophers can invariably dispense with luxury and the irishman is a philosopher he can afford to sit and watch his potatoes growing as content as any king for not only shall that green plant yield unto him and the childer the staff of life but it shall also furnish for him the wherewithal for the innocent manufacture of puccine which is life itself it is a singular fact though a fact big with meaning that while the irishman has been a potato grower from raleigh's time he has not succeeded in attracting to himself any special reputation as a cultivator in this department nobody sets up the irish potato for a peculiar delicacy jersey cheshire lancashire and parts of yorkshire and lincolnshire have secured for themselves all the glory and honour and profit which is to be got out of potato growing it is said however that the irish can cook a potato against anybody in the world but this is doubtful inasmuch as the dublin potato and for that matter the cork or kilkenny or newry potato is neither better nor worse cooked than the common tuber of cockaine this however is by the way the hard fact is that all over ireland you are brought face to face with a poverty and a desolation which are the palpable outcome of too great a reliance upon a doubtful staple the very physique of the people bears abundant witness to the circumstance that a diet of pure potato is not good for one it induces a ricketedness of build a lankness and a want of tone not to mention a confirmed hungriness of look quite half the people of ireland might pass for persons who had lately been emulating the fasting man or had just been let loose from a severe term of penal servitude it is intolerable that it should be so but there is no getting away from it the irish people are physiologically underfed they may eat to repletion but as even an irish potato consists mainly of starch and water precious little corporeal good is to be got out of it when the body is starved the mind dwindles and languishes a potato fed man can no more be witty or wise or energetic than a man fed on draff and husks that is why the irish have almost entirely lost the spirits and the volatility and the graces for which they were formerly renowned if you are to make good use of an irishman as of any other man you must ply him with nutriment the potato is not nutriment in anything like a complete sense even that exceedingly popular work the encyclopedia britannica has no feeling for the potato where the irish are concerned under the head of ireland i found among other things the following sentences introduced by raleigh in sixteen ten the cultivation of this dangerous tuber developed with extraordinary rapidity when petty wrote early in charles the second's reign this demoralizing esculent was already the national food when the precarious exotic failed an awful famine was the result the encyclopaedia britannica also obliges us with the appended information the labor of one man could plant potatoes enough to feed forty potatoes cannot be kept very long but there was no attempt to keep them at all they were left in the ground and dug as required a frost which penetrated deep caused the famine of seventeen thirty nine even with the modern system of storing in pits the potato does not last through the summer and the meal months june july and august always brought great hardship between eighteen thirty one and eighteen forty two there were six seasons of dearth approaching in some places to famine in eighteen forty five the population had swelled to eight million two hundred ninety five thousand sixty one the greater part of whom depended on the potato only the greater part of the population of ireland proper that is to say of ireland with northern diamond left out depends upon the potato to this day it is a state of affairs which cannot be too severely deprecated 
it is a state of affairs which ought in no circumstances to be allowed to continue it is a state of affairs which convinces one only too clearly that ireland has for centuries been governed either by rogues or by blockheads yet the potato like the tourist does not appear hitherto to have been written down for an irish grievance or injustice true the encyclopaedia britannica condemns it as we have seen but it does so rather by innuendo than of set purpose i am not aware that the restriction of potato growing has ever figured as a plank in the platform of the irish party indeed to suggest it would have looked like infamy in the face of the condition of the people but until the irish are taught that the potato is not the first and last thing god made they will remain open to the disasters and the disabilities which too great a dependence upon it have invariably brought about it is lamentable to note the limitations of the irish mind as to what is possible in the matter of food with sixpence your indigenous starving irishman will purchase inevitably a dish of potatoes and as much whisky as can be screwed out of the money when the potatoes have been paid for the beer and bread and cheese or bread and bacon of the english rustic may be reckoned a lucullian feast in comparison and they are at least three times more nourishing to the body if not to the brain and the worst of it is that your proper potato-fed irishman cannot forego his hereditary appetite for the escalant ailment of his country any more than a scotchman can forego oatmeal and offal in the midst of plenty an irishman of the irish will make for potatoes as surely as the needle makes for the north he prefers them to take an instance mr george bernard shaw believes himself to be a vegetarian by free will and out of altruism in point of fact vegetarianism is easy and possible for him because he is an irishman and consequently comes of an ingrained potato feeding stock however remote his wit and other parts if any are to be accounted for by the circumstance that he has the good sense to supplement his potato flour with pea meal cocoa butter and other garnishes a few thousand tons of lentils with pepper and salt to taste would do ireland more good than a new land act she has had enough potato and enough land acts to last her for the next hundred years End of chapter 18 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 19 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T. W. H. Crossland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon Chapter 19 Pigs In Ireland, the pig has long been understood to pay the rent. Hence, no doubt, it comes to pass that Irish rents are not always paid up, that an animal such as the pig, a grunting, groveling, wallower in sloes, should be so popular a favourite among the Irish, does not speak too well for them. In England, the favourite and most bepraised domestic beast is the dog. The keeping of a pup of some sort is a mark of true English blood. Dogs in Ireland do not appear to be so popular. The fact is, of course, that the pig has been thrust down the Irish throat by greedy, grasping landlordism. Their worships, the factors and agents, perceiving that good man Patrick, was hard put to it for the means of subsistence when he had satisfied their rapacious demands, informed him blithely that a pig would make an admirable domestic pet and addendum to the potato patch, and unlike a common dog, could, when you have petted him to a certain sleekness, be killed and eaten or salted and sold so that the wild irishman has taken to pig-keeping with a zest which is without parallel among other races whereas for dogs he has little or no room the english collier who on being met in a lane with a couple of fine terriers was asked by a thrifty landholder if he the collier might have shown greater wisdom had he spent his money on pigs rather than on terriers replied perhaps so but a man would look a damned fool going ratting we two pigs one supposes that in ireland if the people ever do go ratting they do it with these same porkers 
quite apart from questions of sport however the pig is certainly not the sweetest of quadrupeds and to have him with you continually in the house like william had dora must be something of a trial rent or no rent it is notable as indicating the difference between the treatment meted out to the english and to the irish that when a certain woman of epping or some such neighborhood took to the keeping of pigs on the irish principle she was swooped down upon by the authorities who have charge of the public sanitation and compelled to part with her pet in ireland you can maintain familiarly in your kitchen as many pigs as you like and nobody will interfere with you possibly the relationship between the irishman and his pig might be considered reasonable if one were by any means certain that when the pig has discharged his duties as a household pet and comes squalling to the knife he were really meat for the irishman and his family i am afraid however that in too many instances the people are so frightfully poor that the bulk and best parts of the family pig's carcass pass out of ireland onto the breakfast tables of the bloated english under the name and guise of irish provisions on the whole one inclines to the view that even as in the long run the irish would be the happier and the better fed without the potato they might with advantage dispense also with the pig it sounds like rank heresy but i commend this suggestion to all thoughtful legislators the pig requires neither care nor attention in the matter of his bringing up he is a feeder on refuse and garbage he would just as soon sleep on your domestic hearth as in the snuggest sty that was ever built and generally speaking he may be considered a very proper beast for association with an indolent man with the potato shooting up merrily forniced your cabin door and the pig fattening himself gruntingly and without assistance from yourself you may well incline in honeyed ease and never really trouble to do a day's work and it follows that in the course of time you fall irrevocably into the potato and pig habit and acquiesce in the potato and pig standard of living comfort and culture you vegetate like the tuber and you grunt and snore and thrive on nothing like the porker it suits the landlords and the legislators and the philosophers and it fits in entirely with the taint of indolence which always lurks in the irish blood the farming of one pig not to mention the keeping of pigs in cabins should be prohibited by act of parliament there would naturally be great howls from the irish people for nobody is loved with a greater love or treated with a greater amount of respect in ireland than the single pig but he is a blight and a mistake and a failure both economically and socially the irish of america it is true have made fortunes out of him there are cities in america that have been built entirely on pig and the american pork packing interest appears to keep quite half the country going but how have these things been accomplished certainly not by the breeding and rearing of single pigs in people's houses no the american irish have gone in for pig keeping on wholesale and colossal lines they have turned the gentleman that pays the rent out of the house into fields and pens they have made a business of the feeding and fattening of him and they have erected monmouth factories wherein he may be slaughtered and salted down by the thousand ireland might with indisputable advantage take a leaf out of the bulky lard stained book of chicago irish bacon will always command quite as good a price as the best american that was ever exported the english market for it is practically inexhaustible but apparently nobody but the americans has enterprise or courage enough to exploit that market in america the pigs for the packing trade are understood to be fed on apples and pea flour and i have seen it suggested that because they are amply supplied with these staples the american pig feeders will always have the advantage of possible competitors there are neither apples nor pea flour in ireland but there is the potato and if ever an article of food was designed for a special sort of beast the potato was designed for the pig the irish should endeavor to remember that if the potato have any virtue at all it is intended for the feeding of pigs and 
not of human beings. The English farmer does not, when the dinner hour draws near, lead forth his wife and children to his hay chamber for nutriment, and the Irishman should have just a small augustatory regard for his store of potatoes. It is pig feed, my dear Patrick, pig feed, and not victuals at all. If the English peasantry were to take to a diet of chopped hay and husks tomorrow, the English landlords would not lift a little finger to prevent them, and within a twelvemonth they would adjust matters by putting up rents all round. So long as you, the low wild Irish, choose to be content with the same diet as your household pet, so long may you remain content, and so long will the landlords look to it that you get no other food. I do not believe for a moment that Ireland is going to be regenerated on political and measure-making parliamentary lines. Her regeneration will have to come out of herself. So much of it, as has already been accomplished, has come wholly out of herself, and not out of legislation at all. The rest will follow, if the Irish people have a mind to deal as straightly with themselves in the future as they have dealt with themselves in the past. And I should say that at all cost, the potato and pig habit, as it now exists in Ireland, should be broken and got rid of and utterly wiped out. End of chapter 19. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 20 of The Wild Irishman by Thomas William Hodgson, T.W.H. Crossland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 20. Emigration. When Ireland desires to sup the sweeter drops out of the cup of sorrow, she has a way of babbling about exiles from Erin, and that kind of thing. That her population has been greatly reduced by emigration cannot be denied. Neither can one get away from the fact that the true-blooded Irishman has a peculiar affection for the soil on which he was born, and that the pains of expatriation have for him a special and almost intolerable poignancy. But excepting as it bears upon the peace of mind of individuals, on the breaking up of homes, and the wrenching of family ties, I do not think that the emigration, which it is the fashion so to deplore, has been at all a bad thing for Ireland. It is clear that if the country is incapable of supporting adequately the mass of people now resident in it, the persons who have left it for fresh woods and pastures new are on the whole to be congratulated. If it be contended that it is shameful that a man should be compelled to leave his native country because that country does not offer sufficient scope for his energies and fails to provide for him the means of rational human subsistence, I should say that Ireland is by no means singular in such failure. The Scotch emigrate and boast about it. Scotland is a stony country, they say. There are plenty of mouths and little wherewith to feed them. Lo, we will go forth into the undiscovered places of the world and seek food and fortune where they are most likely to be found. The Irish, on the other hand, weep and wail and keen about it. We are leaving the owl country. O corn, we're, we're, and we're true. I'll sit at the top of Vinegar Hill, and there I'll weep till I've wept my fill, and every tear would turn a mill. For be dad, it's across the say. I'll be after goin', and glory knows when I'll be after comin' back again. Goodbye, Terence, and Brian, and Patrick, and Judy and Kathleen, and all the rest of yees. It's me that's got to leave yees, and may all the leading fiends assail the dirty government, and so on and so forth. Tears and howls are the Irish emigrant's stock in trade. I do not deny that this is wrong, but it seems possible that a great deal too much capital has been made out of it, both by the poets and by the politicians excepting at the immediate hour of embarkation the irish emigrant makes a very good emigrant indeed if his emigration takes him only so far as england 
he becomes at once an industrious and not infrequently a fairly prosperous member of the community if his emigration takes him to america the same thing happens to him and he has been known to blossom out into millionairedom why weep for him why recite touching poetry about him and why call the government names on his behoof it is the people who are left at home who should be cried over and recited over and whose condition should provoke the obsecration of the government of course the real truth about the irish immigrant is that when he gets into a new country he is compelled to fall into line with a scheme of existence which is far in advance of anything which has been considered possible in his own country the great stumbling blocks of his life namely the potato patch and the pig pass forthwith out of his purview in england he must live like a civilized being in a house erected and maintained on lines which conform to the requirements of county councils and sanitary authorities very naturally too he drops into the english view as to diet clothing recreations and the like and to secure these things he is compelled to work maybe twelve or it may be fourteen hours a day if the work be hard it is more or less regular and the pay is sure and from the irish standpoint princely in america with anything like luck the irish emigrant finds himself even more favorably conditioned and if he possesses an ounce of sense and he usually does there are chances for him which lead to prosperity at home in ireland the irishman of the poorer class and even of the middle class is absolutely without opportunity he must take things as they are and if he ever thinks about such matters at all resign himself to the mean and uninspiring facts there is nothing in ireland that a man who wishes to get along in life may do the fact being that the country is exhausted and devoid of the elements which are necessary to activity and it seems more than likely that this state of affairs will continue for many years to come capital that is not backed up by arrant greed has become extremely rare of late there is little hope for ireland in the modern sense unless she be exploited and for some reason or other exploitation is nowadays attempted only by persons without bowels who with all their exploiting succeed only in enriching themselves and degrading the persons who toil for them i have said before that ireland's true regeneration must come from within when she took to emigration she began practically this work for years it has been the only way for her it will go on just as long as it is necessary and good for her meanwhile the people at home must be roused from their apathy if the gentlemen who periodically stump the country with a miscellaneous selection of political and religious shibboleths would direct some of their energy and oratory to the social and intimate life of the irish people they might yet accomplish for ireland a work that would be of real benefit to her there is far too much complacency even in the ranks of ireland's best wishers it is taken for granted that the main body of the people of ireland are peasants everybody speaks of them as peasants and everybody talks of them as peasants when goldsmith wrote about a bold peasantry their country pride he did not mean peasantry in the same way that the glib writers and talkers of our own day mean it the word peasant like many another good word has had its ups and downs and for the last half century if not for a longer period peasant as applied to an irishman has amounted really to a condemnation and an excuse ah my dear sir cried the wise you do not know the irish peasant if one is to believe all that one hears the irish peasant is a sort of inferior inhuman creation anything is good enough for him and like the dog in the adage the less you give him and the more you kick him the better he will like you one never hears the slackest politician of them all talking or writing about the english peasant 
it is the sturdy men of kent the hardy men of yorkshire and comrades and fellow workers all the time these men eat bacon and cheese and as much beef as they can lay tooth upon also they drink beer in and out of season and by the bucketful also their children are reasonably well fed and reasonably well clad there's not the smallest boy in england but travels in his shoes hence the english peasantry retain those qualities of boldness and masterfulness and independence without which a peasantry cannot thrive and nobody dare call them peasants nor offer them the treatment which peasants are commonly supposed to delight in the irish need to be taught that they are a race of men and not merely dreamers and martyrs and kickable persons and the first thing for a proper man to do is to make sure that himself and his family live like human beings and compass the food and shelter and decencies which are nowadays considered necessary to human beings the irish politicians have helped ireland to something in the nature of reasonable government they might now conveniently lay themselves out to help her into something that resembles reasonable living at the forthcoming general election we are told great political and party play is to be made with that ancient and bedraggled question home rule the friends of ireland and the friends of england fancy that they see in it something which is going to be very good for ireland in point of fact it is a matter of which next to nothing would have been heard had not mr balfour stood in sore need of a red herring to drag across the idiot noses of the electorate from mr balfour's point of view no doubt the resurrection of the home rule boogie is a singularly adroit move it will confuse the fiscal tariff mongers it will placate the dunderheaded liberal party and it will tickle the irish to death but any man who believes for one moment that it will be of the smallest benefit to ireland is just a fool england made up her mind long ago that home rule for ireland was a sheer impossibility and what is more to the point ireland proper and in the mass is of the same opinion if she desires to take advantage of the opportunities which a general election is bound to provide for her she will let home rule severely alone and base her demands on less political but considerably more urgent and vital things the end end of chapter twenty recording by john brandon end of the wild irishman by thomas william hodgson t w h crossland